Y'all ready for this? So, I have seen a bunch of conversation today on Twitter and other social media, and I've read blog posts and other things that have basically said, these are my thoughts on the BNR, and this is what I would unban. So I want to start with unbanning things first, because one, I think that's more exciting. I think there are more things to talk about when it comes to unbanning than there are banning. At the end, I'm going to discuss the one to two cards I would for sure ban, and then my ideal world, multiple cards I would ban, um, if you sort of gave me all the keys to the castle. But I kind of want to give you the criteria that which I'm sort of have over here on the screen for why I think a card should be banned or not, and sort of the where I'm coming from. And so, really quickly here, uh, <laughs> this is sort of my, you know, criteria slash maybe why you should listen to me. Uh, I'm Mason Clark. I have been doing full-time magic now for a couple months. I have gone to the Pro Tour a couple times. I've done very well in the modern format, and I think the modern format is sort of where I excel. That is sort of the format I have the most knowledge about and the best depth and the strongest understanding of. So um, if you're watching this on YouTube and you sort of stumbled upon it, that's maybe why you should listen to me uh, about this. I'm going to be approaching things uh, from basically the design st a design standpoint more than most. So I'm going to think about the health of the format and not really what I think is fun. Some of my most favorite decks are things like Four Color and Amulet Titan, which are, you know, very fun decks for me. I understand that's not the same thing for everyone else. And so, for example, Summer Bloom is a card that I personally would have a lot of fun playing with, but I think it's not very fun overall. So I'm not going to be like, this is my one exception for a card that I think is really kawaii and I just love playing with it. I'm going to approach things really from, hey, if I was sort of in charge with the ban list, you know, and it was all on me and I had to make the healthiest and most fun game possible of Magic for everyone, what would I do and why, right? And so I'm going to work through all of these and we're just going to talk about them. Each one, even the ones where I think it's maybe a little like obvious to some people why they're banned because there's other people it might not be obvious and they might be newer they didn't play during that time and i think that's part of the fun of all this so you know i could very quickly put a bunch of cards in the banned to good category um but instead i want to quickly sort of talk about them and sort of talk about why and we're gonna have some conversation with twitch chat because i'm sure it's gonna you know spark some debate and spark some conversations as it were so uh, I could start, you know, with just what's on screen, but uh, as unfortunately for YouTube here, in order to have Twitch chat, they sort of take up part of the screen. So I'm going to start with one of the ones you can't actually see on screen right now, and I'm just going to put it over here, and that's Oko Thief of Crowns. I, I, you know, there are very few cards as strong as Oko, and there are few, very few cards that are as unfun, I would argue, as Oko. The most annoying part about Oko is it doesn't really let your opponents play with their cards, right? In a lot of ways, I think if Oko... Um, could only elk your own things. It'd be a really fun card, and it would still be quite good, but it would not be as uh, oppressive and ban-worthy in all the formats that it is in. Uh, basically, turning your opponent's cards off, I think, is really unfun. I think we can all sort of agree that despite Oko's abs making me want to lick hot butter off them, you know, it's not really a fun experience, right? So, not really getting to play with your cards, I think, is unfun and just doesn't lead to good games and just it warps every game. If you ever played a game with Oko, uh, you've had the experience of, you know, mana dork into Oko, and you've been like, oh, wow, this is unreal, right? So, you know, while you know, Twitch chat brings up, Oko does answer the one ring, and that's pretty strong. Uh, it isn't really the sort of thing I think we want to be the answer. And this is a thing that, in general, is maybe worth talking about real quick, is that I've seen a lot of conversations online. Uh, hang on, I'm going to fix my Twitch chat thing on here real quick. So this part isn't there. There we go. Uh, oh, and now I can move it right here. Oh my god, I'm such a gamer. All right. Well, I here we go. Cut. Thank you for the follow, everyone. Uh, I'm gonna not talk about the follows, but assume if you follow, I say thank you slash subscribe. If you, if you subscribe, I'll show you on the video. But anyways, back in. I've seen a lot of conversation online about sort of okay, like well, we have these cards now. Um, these other cards could answer and come back, and I don't know if I really agree with all of that in the same way. And I think, you know, while Twitch chat's joking about Oko, Elks, the One Ring, uh, it does sort of, like, spark a conversation for a lot of people of, like, well, if we're going to allow things like the One Ring or maybe, you know, Solitude or Fury, why can't uh, maybe Punishing Fire come back? And we'll talk more about that later and sort of where I land. But I'm not a super big believer in just because we have some cards that are messed up and have been deemed worthy, why can't we have more messed up cards? I, I don't super jive with that whole conversation you know what i mean um so <laughs> it looks like everyone agrees oko 
abs out the wazoo, but maybe not the most fun. I'm glad everyone liked the little uh, Oka licking the butter thing. I, I felt like I was a little off the rails there for a second. All right. Next up, I guess we need to start from here now because before I was going to try and take care of the cards on the left, but we'll start here. So I'm going to start with the artifact lands, and I'm just going to do all the artifact lands at once um, just because I think it saves us a lot of time. Honestly, I don't even want to have uh, all the artifact lands on the tier list. Um, maybe, hmm, you know what I'm going to do? For the sake of the tier list, I'm going to just put only the one artifact land, and we're going to assume that this is all the artifact lands, just to not make the tier list unreadable and really big right away. Um, awesome. So, makes it uncounterable. Yeah, I, th I think the light halfling bob makes Oko more unfun. I, I have to agree with that. So, I have see the side nod. This is sort of a stand-in for all of the artifact lands. And I think the artifact lands are a little too strong for a few reasons. One, um, they sort of enable certain cards and they act as soul lands. If you don't know what a soul land is, that's sort of a verbiage for a land that makes two mana. So, if you've played EDH or Legacy, you might know Ancient Tomb or City of Traders. Um, but in this case, with the affinity cards and cards that key off, sorry, a dex that and words that key off artifacts, the artifact lands are a little bit too much. So, for example, the white artifact land, which I'll put on screen here, would just be an automatic four of in the hammer deck, right? Now, it would have some downsides, right? Like you're more susceptible to artifact removal. Um, it, like, you know, it has real weaknesses. But for things like Pure Steel Paladin, your land drop uh, being, you know, one of the things that turns on your metal craft is pretty important and really real um, i don't really think it adds a lot of fun gameplay and that that is my big striking point against the artifact lands is i don't think they really add much fun to the game because i don't think blowing up your opponent's lands is a net fun thing personally one of my favorite cards is, <laughs> is tangle Eye. another one's rashad and point another one's wasteland i personally really like blowing up lands i find that a fun experience i am sympathetic and understandable to the idea that yeah people not casting their spells not fun and creating these lands which lead to more games where you know your lands get force of vigor is not super exciting experience and not something i would personally really like to promote so um you know these soul lands are something that i'm pretty against um yeah so trap brings up like urza's tower i guess urza's power plant urza's mine of soul lands too but these things just sort of count as two mana sources when it comes to like affinity um cards and with things like metalcraft i think it's just too much and they just we've really designed a lot of card or i should say wizards has designed a lot of cards with this in mind right that like these cards aren't real and i think you create a lot of potential problems doing that so as much as i would love to have you know more artifact decks in modern I don't think I want to put the power in the, the lands. I just don't think it's very fun. It doesn't lead to a lot more net fun games. Right? So, I, I don't know how Twitch chat feels. How do y'all feel about that? Yeah, the BNR <laughs> means ban and restriction list. Uh, which, you know, maybe you could argue Fable should be there. I, I learned today that Fable has been a four of an every Pro Tour winning deck this year. All right. Well, I was already going to talk about this next card here. Um, so, uh, I don't know how to say your name. Zarax. Um, there has not been any confirmation on if there will be any changes. But we know for sure there's a BNR announcement for all the formats on Monday. And with the new way the system works, it's a one year between uh, BNR announcements. So, if you're going to do something and do something big now is the time to sort of do it um so here we are it's gonna be interesting too much in favor of unbanning stuff 9 percent of the time there is a yeah i agree uh bathrobe king what did ash say take away robin's fable pillion <laughs> never yeah and so you know barring extreme examples there aren't going to be any bnr announcements so that's sort of what's caused everything here so that's my argument for artifact lands uh and we should just talk about the other big artifact card over here and that's mox opal so where does mox opal land right because mox opal here 
a sort of an interesting card. It's a fan favorite, and it allowed decks like Affinity to be really strong, right? Uh, and it was sort of part of combo pieces with things like KCI, etc. I personally think Mox Opal is too good and just shouldn't be banned. Uh, or should, I'm sorry, it should stay banned. Um, first off, I think Urza Saga is a more fun payoff than Mox Opal is, right? Urza Saga sort of fills that role of being the artifact payoff thing. Mox Opal is very strong and would work really well with Urza Saga, right? Uh, you know, Urza Saga would basically become a soul land. Hey, look, we're learning terms. We're incorporating them. But, you know, that, like, float a mana, grab a Mox Opal, make a mana, play a pattern. Probably not super great for the format. Uh, and I just think Saga's way more fun and creates a lot more interesting deck-building decisions, right? Saga's like, oh, wow, I can play, you know, this one Pithy Needle, this one Relic of Progenitus, this one Ginger Brute, right, like we've seen out of Hammer. And it can be a real part of my plan because Saga enables it. And Saga also gives them some real grind potential. So uh, this is too much there. Twitch has brought up another great point that Mox Opal also really does help combo decks. Um, I know Jesse Wompkin, uh, before she was Titty Pills on Twitter, and people really knew who she was, she was a big fan of the Breach Mox Opal deck for like basically a week um, and previews before it actually got banned. And she was testing it a bunch, and she was really happy with it. And you can already see how strong uh, Mox Amber is in that deck. Mox Opal would remove the need to have a legendary uh, thing on the battlefield, right? Which would actually make the combo a lot better. So with that in mind, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of things that Mox Opal does, but it doesn't really add to the fun, right? And when thinking about a BNR announcement and sort of like a BNR list... Fun is a really, really big thing, and it's really subjective, right? Like, my version of fun and your version of fun are probably pretty different. I mentioned before, I really like, you know, Tanglewire and Rashad and Poor and Wasteland. Those are fun experiences for me, even though I know it's not a net fun experience. So, while I definitely believe there are some of you yelling at your screens, typing vigorously mad at me, that Moxable is fun, and I had a lot of fun, and I remember Arcbound Ravager, and just turn to you know, an Arcbound Ravager or a Steel Overseer, that was, or turn one a Steel Overseer, that was my shit. I love it. That is, you know, I'm sympathetic to you, but I'm just not a huge believer that this card's a net, net more fun, and I think it plus Urza Saga would create some actual problems. So I think the card has to, unfortunately, stay banned. Um, while we're talking about mana, we should probably just go over some of the other mana stuff, because I think that's not super... Um, interesting to talk about uh simian spirit guide i think is probably not too good but it, it really speeds up the format in kind of an unfun way um and so i'm putting it on the too good category it maybe should be like makes one deck too op or whatever that's really what it does um but you know it's somewhere in between those two lines and whatever the people on twitter can get mad when they see the final screenshot and be like Oh, what one deck, or oh, it's too good. Um, along the same lines, Rite of Flame, I think the Storm deck probably does need some help and um, isn't. Yeah, Ryan knows what the Simeon Spear guy is actually a deck in Legacy. Good point, chat. Uh, Rite of Flames is a thing that. I am sympathetic that there are not many combo decks that are spell based right now in Modern. And I wish that there were combo decks that were spell-based in Modern. I think that would be really fun. However, I, I don't really think Rite of Flames is the direction I would take to fix that problem. Does that make sense? Um, band, yeah, I think Annoying leads to some weird... Con I ha adding another category might be good. Like, Unfun, but the Unfun category is probably not really good. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Dave brings up that, you know, Belcher, Neoform, these sort of, like, kill you in a single turn deck could argue that, you know. Yeah, I, I fucking hate Ponder. We'll get there. Uh, turns out talking for 25 minutes straight is a lot. Yeah, I guess you could argue Band Too Good is unfun, right? Not really fun to interact with those things. Um, Seething Song, I feel a very similar way uh, as I do with Rite of Flames. I sort of think these cards are not exactly the same card, but are basically the same card. So i really not sort of a fan of those. I don't think they're really worth our time talking about. 
Cloud Post, I, I feel very similarly. Um, I'm putting it in the too good category because I do think it is like actually too good. Um, I, I really don't have anything to say. If Twitch chat wants to talk about, you know, like these fast mana stuff, we can. But these like sort of fast mana and generates a lot of mana, I'm not really in the mood for. Um, one of the biggest critiques I have of Modern is the free spells have really changed it forever uh, in a way that I personally don't know is the best. Um, but it is the world we live in, so, you know, whatever. I would maybe try to change, like, Fury and Solitude, and maybe Grief, but definitely Fury and Solitude, and have those not be cards. Um, but we're, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, so, you know. Yeah, the problem is there's a chance that Cloud Post might not be too good, but is it really adding a lot to the games? Because that sort of experience is already provided in the format, in the form of Tron, and we know Tron is not too good for the format, right? We know that there are things we can do to beat Tron. Tron can do things like this weekend where you can be incredibly well positioned. You can have innovative builds, and you can play really well, and sort of bank on the metagame, working out the right way, and do incredibly well. Um, yeah. Yeah, but what if someone, yeah, if someone plays it? What if what if people play it? Also, along that same line, could of Bob, it's like, all right, what if we have to re-ban it, right? Like, I'm sort of thinking about this, like, you know, I'm in charge of the ban list. What is going on with the ban list? I don't want to re-ban cards, right? And I'm Wizards of the Coast. Re-banning a card is a colossal failure in my mind. Um, obviously, re-banning, I should say this, re-banning a card within two years is a colossal failure. Since they sort of know the next two years, roughly, of cards. Um, that's kind of, like, our understanding of where the design is at. Um, so, like, if something in ten years made you reban a card, for example, let's say Wild Nakata for some reason had to be rebanned, I would not call that a failure in, like, Watsi's eyes, uh, or in my eyes for Watsi. But if you ban a card, like, let's say you unban Golgari Grave Troll, and you had to ban it again within two years i would argue that is not a good look that i would argue that is egg on your face i would argue why didn't you see this coming um uh, so you know here we are uh but yeah I, I also you know even if cloud post isn't better than tron and it is just you know same tron or whatever does that really add a lot of texture to the format and does that really do what y'all as players want right or i should say we as players want um like, we sort of want things to shake things up and change and be exciting. And, you know, in a lot of ways, Nicotl getting unbanned, got it. it was exciting for some players for a short bit, sort of actually didn't have the infrastructure around it to support it as a deck anymore, and now it's finally seeing play again, and that's exciting, right? But Nicotl not doing very much, I'd argue, is like, well, you unbanned something, but nothing really changed, so, you know, like, good unban right but not super exciting um which i do think plays a small part of this what is this bridge a yeah. oh, bridge from below is not a magic card we'll talk about that <laughs> dredge is a downside though you're milling yourself that's true by the way have y'all thought about that the best pioneer deck is a mill deck like wow modern green tron just being the best mill deck is crazy in pioneer Oof, can't get over it Yeah, post this exactly what you want. And that's right. And that's why you're labeled Tron Girl. That way everyone knows that we can just glaze over what you read. It looks like a guy running on fire. What? The top seven to the right. One, two, three, four, five. Six. Oh, this one? This is Blazing Shoal. We'll talk about Blazing Shoal. No, Bob's wrong. This, this looks like a guy throwing a fire axe. Yeah, Blazing Shoal. I guess we could talk about it now. Have we done all of the the busted mana stuff? We kind of have. I kind of want to leave some of the cards that have been around for a while that I think are pretty interesting. Oh, Chrome Mox. Thank you. Where's Chrome? There it is. Chrome Mox. It's just too good. I don't know if y'all ever played No Banless Modern. Chrome Mox is very strong there. Just... Uh, you know how you trade cards 
like you you discard a card and then you fury and you like undying malice and it's worth it like that plus a lamb at playing your spells is really good and chromox is nice chromox is really strong with things like emery it's really strong with like metalcraft stuff it's just like basically a mox uh not quite but basically a mox um so I think that does it when it comes to fast mana. Once again, our artifact lands on the bottom of the screen are all sort of in the seat of the side nod category because I think this is the best art. Don't at me. I think we've done all the fast mana. So now I think we can just start going. I guess we can just go in order here. That might be the best way to do it. Um, oh, I have Ugin. Yeah, I have Ugin technically is two mana. That's a good point. I have Ugin. I guess this one technically goes into the makes one deck OP uh, category, but this this card is just a soul land once again. Creates two mana, but honestly, Eye of Ugin is more than a soul land because it's every time you cast a spell. So, like, for example, um, Eldrazi Mimic is zero mana, and then you could also play Mataru Shaper on the same turn. So it's like it made four mana on the first turn. Or, as we saw from the Pro Tour, they might go things like Mimic Mimic something right and now we're talking about like it generated six mana it's like whoa this is crazy uh, excuse me i have Ugin is incredibly strong and produces just so much mana and it's just over the line we learned this from Jersey winter we've learned from pre-modern i'm sorry no bandless modern my mistake on the name there no bandless modern has really taught us hey the eldrazi deck is really good it continues to do well and while i think that format is underexplored and I would love to explore No Ban Less Modern um, with some real incentives. And I'm like, you know, hopefully going to be doing a streamer event in the next three months uh, with like big names and try and throw money at it and see what the format looks like if people try. Um, regardless, I, I think, well, Underexplored, the Eldrazi are very, very good. Um, so I, I wouldn't give too much. Um, then I show it on Dan. He's moving a busted man, Dork is fine. So I So yeah, so this interesting category about Summer Bloom. I think the way Summer Bloom is played, it probably goes in this conversation too. Um and I think after that we've done everything because Deathrite Shaman is a mana dork and not broken only for like mana reasons, right? Um so I, I think y'all bring up a good point, especially Spencer, where it's just like this should probably just be in this category, uh, especially in the makes one deck two good category. Um, as we saw from this past weekend with Dom Harvey, congrats Dom, huge fan uh, and friend of the stream, got top four playing Amulet Titan with a deck that a lot of people think is sort of just mid right now, right? It is a totally fine deck, and if you are really good at Amulet Titan like Dom Harvey, you can do really well with Amulet Titan. It's probably my favorite or second favorite deck of all time that's what got me my first big finish i got a scg open top eight with it and i love amulet um summer bloom is just too much if you don't know summer bloom it's just one g you can play two additional lands this turn um that is very very good with like the bounce lands etc and i don't think it's really creating a lot of fun games and we already have the amulet experience in the format so all this does is just make amulet like really strong and I don't know if that's really a fun thing to promote, right? I personally love... It's three additional lands. My bad. I misspoke. Uh, it's three additional lands. Um, I guess someone do exclamation point Summer Bloom for me in the chat. That'd be great. Um, but you may play up to... Yeah, sorry. It's, it's great. It's three additional lands this turn. Make, that's right. Because the play pattern is... Sorry. You play Amulet on one. Then you play your land on turn two. If it's a bounce land, you float mana, right? Then you cast Summer Bloom, and you go Bounce Land Float, Bounce Land Float, Bounce Land Float, play Primeval Titan, kill you. Uh, that's a turn two kill slash kill in the format. And yes, cards like Leyline Binding can interact. Yes, Solitude can interact. Yes, there are ways to do things now. The format has changed. Force Negation. I do not think that is something that we should be putting in the format. And just because those cards exist does not mean broken cards get to exist. And I don't think cards that lead to unfun play patterns should exist. Because here's the thing that I think people miss a lot when having these conversations about the ban list, right? And sort of like, well, if solitude is legal, how is this not unbanned? And, you know, I don't think everyone feeling forced to play solitude or forced to play fury 
actually like is something we want to create, right? So for example, let's say we unban unban summer balloon, right? Well, if we unban summer balloon, then oh, like okay, amulet's better. Let's say you know amulet becomes fifteen percent of the metagame, right? Everyone who has solitudes in their deck can maybe fight through amulet bloom, right? Blue white control gets a bunch of dress downs. And, you know, they put those in their deck and they fight over Amulet and turns out Amulet's like, you know, beatable at the highest level. Meanwhile, little, you know, Jimmy and Robin are at their LGS and they get their ass kicked every week because they're playing some god awful deck that doesn't play those cards. They don't want to play those cards so they don't think it's fun and they'd rather play their Hammer cards or their, <coughs> you know, Merfolk cards or whatever it is, right? And maybe there are things they can turn to that maybe make the matchup somewhat winnable. But in reality, that's right, Robin, you've now become my NPC for female player at a store. Um, you know, but, you know, like those players, like they are now kind of priced into that, right? And we're creating an experience that I don't think is super fun for them, where we're saying, buy solitude, idiot. And, you know, full disclosure, I already think we kind of live in a modern format that's like, Hey, if you're not playing Solitude or Fury or Grief or one of these other free spells or strong, really strong spells, you kind of have to be doing something like that, right? And I, I think we already kind of live in there, but we all are real cool about it. We're real cool. We, we just, no one say anything. Yo, act cool, act cool. Let everyone play their decks, have fun. Modern's more fun that way. And so really doing something that's like, making the format say, hey, do this idiot where you're gonna lose, I think is not super fun for non psychopaths right? I would guess just, you know, putting in the chat here, how about this, chat, put one in the chat if you think you're, you're like, you self-identify as a spike, right? Once again, a spike is someone who is a competitive player and winning above all else, right? You think winning is very fun. I, I put myself as a one, yeah, right? A lot of you, I think, are spikes, would be my guess. I guess there's a lot of spikes and a lot of uh, Johnny, Johnny Janie? Is Janie the female term for it? Uh, but, in, like, brewers, innovative people, you know, people who like to do the cool stuff, right? I imagine there's a fair bit of y'all as well. Did my screen just flicker? Weird. Yeah, so, you know, there, there's a good number of y'all, and lurkers are appreciated. So, you know, I don't think we really add a lot to the format by saying, well, in a really loud, overt way, play Solitude Idiot, play Fury Idiot, play, you know, those sort of things. Um... And I think when we do, kind of leads to a less fun format. Yeah, that, that is weird that the screen flickered, but whatever. The stream's still working fine and everything, and so. Okay. Yeah, I, Bob, unironically agree. The fact that you can't just play like your three color sort of thing and be very notably tricked into thinking you had a real chance i think is a failure of the modern format uh currently i don't think your deck was ever that good i don't think three color trade binder like junk or sultai or abzan cards was actually a winning viable super strong strategy now abzan with birthing pod is a different conversation but like cards out of my binder not really a strategy but guess what it doesn't fucking matter if it is or it isn't if people feel like they can go and do those things and they can go and play. And currently, I think sort of mask off, the format has been like, yeah, you just don't get to do that. It's much more in your face. And, you know, along those same lines, I think it's very in our face that we're playing Modern Horizon block constructed in a lot of ways, right? While I do think Modern has, you know, a lot of cards that aren't from Modern Horizons 1 and 2, we just have a lot of cards from those formats and they have changed the format. I personally enjoy the format more. I personally don't think it was a good direction to take Modern uh, to the extreme they did, understand why they did what they did and how we got here, fully understand that, but and I'm sympathetic to their goal, like what they're trying to do, but I think we've sort of overstepped, right? And we need to course correct now. So that's where I'm at. Yeah, I, I think buffing a single deck is sort of strange unless you think it is an actively really fun experience. Um, I would argue like Bloodbright Elf was always going to be a thing that really helped Ponza decks and like Jund decks more than anything. And that's like okay, right? Like 
that's fine. That's something that could really help the format. But like, I think that only goes into one deck is sort of, I think, a little dubious. Um, unless it's really fun. And I, I would argue Bloodbraid Elf is a really fun card. Um, it was a little too good for an era, but it's no longer too good, right? So, wow, we spent a lot of time on that. But I think it was important. I think it was important. Yeah, I didn't see any PT play. That's so true. All right. So, here we are. <coughs> now we can start going through the list. I think, let's double check. Deathrite Shaman technically produces extra mana. Green Sun Zenith Exit technically produces extra mana. But everything else doesn't do extra mana stuff. So I think we're good to just sort of, well, Second Sunrise does, but we are not going to talk about that for a bit. All right. Awesome. Great. Um, that's an interesting question on the Delve spells. Would I dump them as extra mana? No, I think they're cheating on mana, which I think is very different. Um, I think producing extra mana... Good question. But I think producing extra mana goes in multiple places. Well, Delve spells all go singularly. So while I think Treasure Cruise spoilers too good to be unbanned, um, it is... Hi, nerd. Uh, it is something that... Personally, I, I delineate a little differently because when I have, for example, Chromox in a deck, right? Chromox produces extra mana for lots of cards. So, um, you know, we can Chromox out Ren and Six on turn one. That's pretty, you know, maybe not the best thing to be doing in the world. Or Dash or, or Ragavan turn one. Um, but not the same as Delve, which reduces own cost. But great question. Um, Storm decks. Also, like, Belcher decks. Specifically, Seething Song, I think, moves Belcher a little too far in the uh, one direction. I think you could argue that Iron Crag Feet does a similar role, but I think it is different. We got all the mana stuff taken care of. We're good. Let's move on and start talking about these other cards. There, I could jump around. I could take chat suggestions. But what instead I'll do is I'll shill out. If you subscribe with Prime or Normal Tier 1, I'll cover the cards you want to talk about immediately. Otherwise, we're going to go left to right. So you can wait, or you can premium skip ahead. What is it modern day sales if we don't let you premium skip ahead, right? Um, so Astrolabe is not mana, but it is time to talk about Astrolabe. So Astrolabe technically doesn't generate mana. It filters mana, right? Where cards like Eye of Ugin. Oh, thank you. Spencer gifted some subs. To both uh, Actual Bunny and Connor. Thank you so much, Spencer. I'll do your card after Ar Arkham's Astrolabe. Um, Arkham's Astrolabe <coughs> generates uh, a filtration of mana, right? It doesn't actually produce extra. So Chrome Mox makes a mana. Arkham Astrolabe lets you have different colors. Um, that's funny. I wish that was true. Uh, so with that in mind, where does this go? So, Arkham's Astrolabe, I think, is pretty egregious. Um, it just can trips at very little cost to you, the player, and fixes all of your mana problems while also just being an artifact for things, excuse me, like Metalcraft, um, Urza, etc. But does that mean it's too good? I don't know. Um, personally, I think that this card just makes mana too good and reduces all sort of deck building stuff and sort of condenses it down to snow lands only right and your deck should probably just play arkham's astrolabe which i'm not a huge fan of spoilers i think mishra's bobble should probably not be in the format so um not even from like a power level perspective just from like a it just goes in too many things i don't think it's as bad as arkham astrolabe but i think it is just a little bit too much um I do like uh, Ice Spend Coatle, one of my favorite cards, so I'm kind of with you there, Bob and Spencer, but I'm a little, uh, you know. So this card sort of generating all the mana, I think, is a little too much. That being said, um, I think if Arkham's Astrolabe required snow mana to activate it as well, I might be a little bit more sympathetic to the card. Um, but I think snow mana to cast... Any mana to activate is really weird, and I don't like the card from the, like that little design perspective or whatever as well. So 
not hugely in love with Arkham's Astrolabe. I think it's just a little bit too good and probably just goes into too many decks. So I think it's probably somewhere between the too good and the makes one deck OP. I'm not sure where, but for right now, we're going to sit on this as where I've kind of add on it. It's just... Uh, and this is like a uh, this is like a Mason design philosophy. I bet y'all didn't expect this to be the Mason design philosophy stream and YouTube video. But from a design standpoint, I think when we bleed the colors too much at too low a cost, it becomes a real problem, right? Like Birds of Paradise is okay. That card doesn't really do much outside of make mana, right? In a lot of ways, you're spending a mana and a card on a land. Arkham's Astrolabe doesn't even make as much mana as Birds does, right? But it replaces itself and is a much harder to interact with game object than an O1 bird. Um, so while an O1 bird might actually be stronger in some contexts, I think Arkham's Astrolabe just sort of moves around too much. Um, also, imagine we had Arkham Astrolabe during the Yorion time. That would have been fun. So, as much as I like Astrolabe, and for what it's worth, I should say this real quickly. I think having mana requirements and mana not being free is good. Um, like, and I think it generally is a better format when your mana isn't uh, totally, like, there's no real thought to it. Um, inversely, I don't love Pioneer, where its mana is sort of doing what I'm talking about, right? I think there's some middle ground between Arkham's Astrolabe Fetchland world and Pioneer, that we ideally need to reach. I don't really know what that looks like. I'm hoping Pioneer reaches that someday, but I think fetch lands are also too good. And if I could ban cards and not have it nuke a format or whatever, fetch lands would be really high on my list. They are just 10 of the strongest cards in modern. It's pretty obvious, but importantly, they make the games more fun. They're an integral part of the format. And so I, I wouldn't ban them. Um, but you know, if I could just, if this was a living card game where you spent $10 a month and you had all the cards, I would be more aggressively banning cards. And one of those cards would be the 10 fetch lands. Um, a little side note there. All right. So, yeah, that's actually a great point. The, the, Bird getting counterplay from removal is, unironically, um, a big part of it. So, Spencer, you donated some subs. Heezy. What card do you want me to talk about? Or are you cool for me just to keep going for now? Gonna give Spencer a second and give me a second to drink some Coke. Pick from the people I give. Okay, Connor and... Who was the other person? Actually, a cute bunny. Uh, you two, feel free to comment what you want. Uh, if you gift a sub, I will go over your card slash if you subscribe. But we'll eventually get to all of them, so you can wait. All right. Mental misstep. <laughs> I don't think this really adds much to the format. Um... Okay, I'll talk about Birthing Pot in a second, Spencer. I don't think Mental Misstep really adds much to the format and is actually along the lines of, like, Solitude, Fury, sort of restrictive free cards I don't really like. Mental Misstep is worse because Misstep goes in every... Well, could go in every deck, and the best answer to a Misstep is another Misstep, right? So I don't really think that adds a lot to the format, and that really... Like... How do I describe this? It doesn't really create a lot more fun gameplay, Right? While, you know, it's cool in some moments and could create exciting stuff, it doesn't really add much. It is worth noting, I think Mental Misstep actually is a story. Talk about the best friend. All right, I'll talk about Lurus and Birthing Pod in the second here. Those will be our next two because of the gifted sub. If you want your card to be talked about sooner than later, feel free to gift a sub or subscribe. Um, Mental Misstep, when it was printed, everyone said, well, one-drop decks are banned. You can't do it anymore. And do you know what one the week one the legacy scg open when mental misstep was legal it was goblins a deck that was heavily reliant on one mana cards uh, cavern of souls wasn't the thing yet cavern of souls wasn't a magic card they had aether vial aether vial notably a one mana card so 
People love to say things like, well, decks are dead. This card is too good against these. It can't exist. People will still play them and succeed and do stuff with them. They might not do it at the same level they would before, but always an interesting story that I think about a lot when people say a thing is dead. It needs to be really, really good for it to be dead. You know, people say, oh, Hammer is dead right now. Hammer is not dead. And if you go to a open big tournament, you will run into Hammer players. We run into as many as you did before. Probably not, but they still exist. So. Yeah, I think Goblins also played four missteps. Um, but, like, every deck played four missteps. So, like, you know. Anyways. So, I'm going to start with Spencer's cards. Uh, Birthing Podcast Spencer is first. This is probably... I, I think I have five takes that y'all are going to hate. I'm fully expecting to get a lot of hate messages and say I'm an idiot, and I'm happy to have the conversation with y'all about this. Birthing Pod, I think, is probably number two or three on the list. And um, it's worth mentioning that Birthing Pod is a card that Wizards of the Coast have actually openly talked about on Twitter. Aaron Forsythe said, We often talk about unbanning Splinter Twin, but we don't talk about unbanning Pod. And that's because I, and I think Aaron and them agree, Pod is too good. So Pod technically probably makes one deck OP, but I'm putting it in the too good category to really send the message for right now. So here's the thing about Birthing Pod. And I've had this conversation a lot over the last couple of days. Birthing Pod, so for, first off, here's the first thing. If you tell me Birthing Pod is just Yawgmoth, you're, you're oversimplifying the conversation and you're just not talking about the truth. Would Yawgmoth decks maybe play Birthing Pod? Maybe. Would Birthing Pod decks maybe play Yawgmoth combo? Probably not. I don't think so, at least. Maybe they would. I, I don't know for sure. But I do know this. With any one creature in play, you could go up the chain with Birthing Pod and win the game. So let me give you an example. Um, also, whoever keeps uh, putting exclamation point the cards when I'm bringing them up, hero, hero, keep it up. Um, so, if I have Birthing Pod in play, right, um, let's say I do it off a Birds of Paradise, right? I cast Birthing Pod, I put it in play, I can then activate it and go get Corridor Monitor, which untaps my Birthing Pod. Then I can go get Deceiver Exarch, which untaps my Birthing Pod. And then I can go get the 4-mana version, which untaps... And then I can go get Spirit Guide. Uh, I think it's called Karmic Guide. Sorry, I always say Spirit Guide, but Karmic Guide. Karmic Guide, get back the untapper, untap the pod, turn the 4-mana 1 to Kiki-Jiki. Infinite. Infinity. I win. Game's over. I've won, you've lost. I copy the guide, the Karmic Guide. Karmic Guide gets back the untapper, untapper, untaps Kiki-Jiki. I go, blah, 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 and you're dead. You're dead, you're dead, you're dead. It's over. I'm going to ask you all, and I get it. Some of you love Birthing Pod, and I am sympathetic. I think it's such a fucking cool design. From a design standpoint, mwah, so cool. Awesome. Turns things into things. Vanifar is one of the coolest cards of the last five years, even though it's just a riff on Birthing Pod. I love all of that. That's great. That's awesome. What the? Is this an ASMR video now? Uh, no, but jokes aside, uh, Birthing Pod is so cool. And I really, 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 really like it. But I really like that you all like it. It is just too good. It just wins the game. And this is the important part about this. Now, I listed a lot of creatures, right? Corridor. Hippocampus, or sorry, Deceiver Exarch. Um, whatever the four mana one is, it's the name I'm forgetting at the moment. Kiki Jiki and Guide. That's five cards, right? And the four birthing pods, we're talking about nine cards, right? And then you gotta play with mana dorks. So we're talking about, what? 16, 17 cards, somewhere in there, right? The blah, 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 noise. So that's like 16, 17 cards, right? That is you know, a pretty relatively small package to win the game when eight of the eight to seven of those cards are cards I'm actively excited to play, right? 
I really want to play birds. I, I want to play, uh, you know, arboreal grazer type cards. I want to play delighted halfling. Those are things I kind of want to do in my creature deck. And birthing pod had the added benefit of back then the removal spells were worse, right? We didn't have solitude, prismatic ending, leyline binding, fury. Those sort of things are true that those would keep the pod deck down. But, like I talked about earlier in the video and in the stream, I don't believe just because some things are around and they might oppress these things means we should unleash pod in the world, right? So, pod is very dangerous. And Vex here just made a great point in chat. We are talking about rough sketches of pod, right? We're talking about rough ideas. In reality, right, Pod's going to be a lot better than we think it is. Pod is going to be a very strong card. It's going to be like, <laughs> like, here's an example. Think about every card that's ever been strong. Close your eyes and think with me for a second, unless you're driving. Then keep your eyes open. Think. Think about the first day of decks with that card. Then think about the second day. Then think about five days. Then think about the second week, Right? All of those things, let's be careful. Uh, all those things are important, right? But you are not going to be playing with fucking Siege Rhino in the year 2023 with Butt Ripping Pod. You might be doing it, right? Komodo Drake and chat might be putting in Siege Rhino, but the people you're playing against, on average, are going to do evil, evil things with Birthing Pod. And. Yeah, Kitchen Finks was a... I, I, Ari Lack said this recently in, a, in a, his podcast, and I love Dominaria's Judgment. I listened to it on release. But he said F Kitchen Finks was a strong card back then, and that's why people played it. And that was a big thing. It's not super good right now. They would just play better cards than Kitchen Finks. Or if they did play Kitchen Finks, it would be okay. It's not like Kitchen Finks is a particularly weak card. It is weaker than it was in the year 2012. No shit. <laughs> I digress. But yeah, that's a great point. What if I go end of turn Bowmaster you? Shoot down your thing. Play Birthing Pod. Combo off the chain. You're fucking dead, idiot. I have a Flash creature that I'm super happy to play with. Fucking die. You know, that is that is what Birthing Pod says. So. So. Birthing Pod, too good. Too good, fuck you and die is what it says. And I say fuck you and die to Birthing Pod. That was a lot, Spencer. Now, actual bunny went us to talk about Luris. I'm just gonna put Luris in the too good category. We're just gonna we're gonna put old our old friend there and talk about it real quick. Luris is recent enough that I expect a lot of you to have played against Luris, right? And Luris creates some interesting deck building challenges. She says, hey, permanents need to cost two or less. Non-creature spells can be more, right? So for, in case you've never played with Luris, um, you could have Kolagon's Command in your deck. That's a non-creature spell that's mana value more than two. You could not have Fable the Mirror Breaker, right? And as much as I would like to incentivize not playing Fable the Mirror Breaker in a format, um, but uh, psh, uh, it isn't worth the squeeze. <laughs> so here's a little secret about magic. Uh, 137 of you here. Uh, here's a little free one from coaching. Uh, playing cheap, strong spells and playing multiple spells in a turn are often some of the best things you can be doing in magic, right? So typically, a lot of these stronger decks in a lot of formats allow you to multi-spell and do lots for very little mana. Um, let's take an example of Rakdos Scam from the most recent Pro Tour, our most recent champ. Uh, shout out to them, Dross. Uh, they can do things like turn one grief twice with an undying effect, right? That's really strong. They can also do things like Ragavan plus Thoughtseize to like hit you and break you up a little bit. That's really strong. They can do a lot of multiple things. They can go Bowmaster to kill your thing and then Fury to kill the rest, right? There's a lot of multi-spell things. So Luris really incentivizes those things. And Luris does a very similar thing that Birthing Pod does that I didn't mention, which is 
puts a lot of downward pressure on design, right? If you have to design with Birthing Pod and Luris in mind, both those cards, it becomes really, really hard to design fun, exciting, desirable cards, right? That's, spoilers, that's their job. That's, they're trying to create a fun thing with exciting stuff. And making it so cheap cards are banned is not super fun. Also, I would argue Luris plus Dress Down is one of the most unfun gameplay patterns we've had since Oko. <laughs> and maybe ever, where a lot of decks just got fucking turned off, right, immediately. And I, I remember, I'll never forget, I was watching a 2K in Knoxville, Tennessee, and one player, I think it was actually Tron Girl in chat, she had Luris in play and was flashing back her dress down at the end of her turn against a Humans player. And the Humans player was at head on board a decent amount. But because dress down was being looped every single turn, the Luris player got to play with their creatures, got to use their cool cards, went up cards every turn, and the Humans player couldn't do anything. Now, you can make the argument that Humans isn't a very good deck or humans has been outmoded, right? But when you all say stuff like that, and then you tell me, oh, these other things exist, we should unban cards, right? Think back to this moment, because that's what you're doing to other decks. You're outmoding them, right? So, yeah, the human player clearly should have brought Solitude or something. I don't know. But regardless, I will never, ever, ever forget the Luris dress down interaction. Luris is unequivocally one of the strongest cards in Magic history. Thank you so Let's much. Talk about depths. All right, depths is up next. Thank you so much for your subscription with Twitch Prime. It means the world. Full time job, etc. Here, dark depths. Whew, a lot to go over. So, dark depths. If you haven't played with this card, it's sort of a weird card. Maybe someone can exclamation point dark depths for me. Um, oh, we're getting to skull clamp soon. Uh, dark depths. Hey, J Shrimp, thank you so much. I'll go over a card you want in a second. Uh, Dark Depths makes a 2020 once you've removed the ice counter. So, with a card like Vampire Hex Mage, you immediately get a 2020 in play. So, is that too good in a world where Leyline Binding and Prismatic Ending and Solitude exist? Right? Is that too good? Or is it just risky to unban but might be worth it? Right? I just listed a lot of cards that beat this card. I just listed, you know, I didn't even list some of them. Brazen Borrower is a card that could beat this card, right? Um, what are some other ones? There's, um, isn't the other Unsummon? Bose yeah, Boseju in response to Vampire Hex Mage. Makes this card, you know, a thing, right? I've just, dead gone. Yes, exactly. Thank you, that was the bounce spot I couldn't think of. I was like, I think Rhinos plays it, but I couldn't remember the name, right? Is this just too risky? I'm sorry, is it risky to unban maybe worth it? I've listed 10 cards. If you've been here the whole time, you're going to know my answer. Fuck no! Why are you wanting this to be a part of the format? Odawara! Another thing that maybe stops it, right? But why do you want Dark Depths, Thespian Stage, Vampire, Hex Mage, and the Renin Six world to be a fucking part of the format? Why do you want the format to be you have to play Leyline Binding? You have to play Solitude. You have to play these cards. Why do motherfuckers keep telling me this shit? It's driving me crazy! Right? So, <laughs> so, when, when people tell me, well, fucking, I got Prismatic ending all of these cards. Fucking, it's, you can kill it easily. It's like, okay, maybe you can kill it. Maybe you could, but does adding a turn to 2020 into play sound fun? Does forcing everyone and mask offing that you have to play these white removal spells, does this sound fun to you? I play the white removal spell decks all the time. I do that already. I don't want to make people think you have to do that. Do you think I... <laughs> Yeah, someone just brought up people with scam grief with Dark Depths combo or some shit. That is a great point. This stream is amazing. Thank you so much, Whiskey Dingo, for the sub. Uh, 
I'm glad y'all are liking it. I'm really liking this. I wish I could do this kind of stream every day. Maybe I can. Maybe I can do Pioneer tomorrow. Who knows? But um, I- I'll tell you this. <laughs> I will tell you this 100%. Also, Whiskey Dingo, you get to pick a card. Uh, so does Jay Shrimp. Uh, to for me to talk about unbanning. Uh, next up to skip the line. If you don't want to, that's fine. I'll just go through the list normally. But Dark Depths and Scam, right? Both create some, I would argue, unfun play patterns. Put a one in the chat if you think it's fun to get double griefed on turn one. Anyone want to put a one? Not you double griefing somebody, you getting double griefed. Oh, wow. Marceline's crazy. All right, ban all those people who think it's fun to get double griefed on turn one. They're like, Jesus Christ, I love getting double griefed. Double grief me, daddy. There you go. Yeah, just stop neck out of it. Exactly. No, jokes aside. Um, yeah, I'm not kink shaming anyone that likes to get double griefed. That's fine. This is a kink free, this is a kink supported zone. We talked about licking butter off of Oko's abs earlier. We're in it, right? Not a very fun experience for a lot of players. Now, some people do enjoy it. I have bought the scam deck. I had so much fun yesterday playing my locals where I was playing against, God bless him, this guy playing black, green, heroic, infect in modern. He just started playing and he went turn one ignoble. And I was like, oh, I've never seen this guy before. It looks like he's playing Yawgmoth. I scammed a grief. And he revealed two heroic creatures that I still don't know their goddamn name of. And I was like, what's going on? Right? <laughs> All of those things are cool. But, right? And it's cool that this guy also has some deck with a bunch of cards I've never fucking seen before. And he beat me in one game. He, he did the thing. He played Ivy and actually copied my kill spell on his Rot Priest onto the Ivy which triggered the poison to kill me. Well, it didn't actually kill me, but it made it so I actually took two extra poison and ended up killing me, right? That's super sick. That was a fun experience. I had fun. Do you know what my opponent didn't have? He went, ugh, when I griefed him, and he read the card and figured out what was going on. He was new to modern. Dark Depths is going to do the same sort of things where it just basically wins. I think Grief is more fun than Dark Depths. It doesn't end the game immediately, right? Like, for example, I think Sire of Insanity is a fun thing to have the reanimate spell be, right? If you turn one a Sire of Insanity, you can fucking beat that easily, right? Legacy, I turn one Sire of Insanity, you discard your whole hand, you draw planes, you play planes, I attack you for six, you know, you draw swords, you swords me. Hell, you miss a turn and you swords me. The next turn, right? You can beat these things. Dark Depths is just going to fucking murder people. And I really think, because people talk about Loam plus Dark Depths and Legacy, right? Do you think Loam, Vampire, Hexmage, Renin 6, Dark Depths combo wouldn't be like a thing that's pretty strong in modern? I'd argue, right? Not super fun. (laughs) Not not super fun. Probably not what we want to encourage. So, um, you know, I've talked a lot about like mask offing and basically being like hey you kind of have to play these spells where you're going to lose idiot i i think if we unban cards like dark depths we're, we are doing that so okay there we go i don't think i saw j shrimp or whiskey dingo say the card they wanted i'm gonna go double check though just to make sure hello just going to how you doing um when you're done, my choice is Second Sunrise. Okay, Second Sunrise for Jay Shrimp. And then Whiskey Ningo said Top. So I'm going to do Second Sunrise, then Top. So I'm going to move these to the front of the list. So Second Sunrise, you don't know this card. It's kind of weird. It originally, thank you so much for looking at that, Nicole. Um, it originally is a card that's basically, if something left the battlefield. Yeah, I'll, I'll read it real quick because it's weird. It says instant, each player returns to the battlefield all artifact creatures and enchantments and lands that were put there in the graveyard this turn. So it's eggs, right? And this was like a thing where you would sacrifice a bunch of stuff, make a bunch of mana, um, draw a bunch of cards, and then Second Sunrise bring them all back. My problem with Second Sunrise isn't power level. I mean, it is strong, right? But it's kind of like, I don't know if that's actually much stronger than scape shifting someone right it is much more about time 
as will our next card, Divining Top. This card takes a long time to win, and it isn't even always deterministic, right? Yeah, great point from Twitch here, right? Nicole, you thought Yorion was slow. Wait till you have second Sunrise turns. So this card is just like <laughs> very, very slow. So basically what happens is you would sack a bunch of things, and we would do this again somehow, right? You trigger a bunch, and then you second sunrise, bring them all back, do it again. So Chromatic Sphere, Chromatic Star are an example, right? So you churn through your deck, churn through your deck. Um, in KCI, which we'll get to eventually, it would do this um, and, like, go off. And once again, I am very, very sympathetic to combo players in Modern. I understand you don't have a lot of decks, but I do not think the solution is to give you second sunrise. I think the solution is is to give you new cards. And if I worked at Wizards of the Coast, I would try to print you new cards. That's what I would do. But, Second Sunrise, not cool. Not it. KCI, not it. This takes too much time. So, Divining Top. Where is Sensei's Divining Top? All it does is let you look at the top of your deck, rearrange a little bit, and sort of, I'm sorry, Jay Shrimp, and sort of be like, hmm, what to do? What to do? And this right here is exactly why I hate Divining Top. As I'm thinking about where to put Top. And it's sort of a not really fun experience. And it slows down tournaments. So, while I think Top is also probably too good. And gives you too much selection with the fetch lands. And introduces cards like Counterbalance to the format in a real weird way. Um... Not very fun. I don't think it's very good. It would be really cool with cards like Monastery Mentor and Dark Path Iconoclast. And there's a lot of fun things you can think of. And I'm sure a lot of you are thinking about fun things you can do with Divining Top, right? I can think of a lot of fun things to do with Divining Top. Do you think the real world's going to do fun things with Divining Top? Right? Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe we need to create a terminate integrity type thing. We're like, uh, takes takes too fucking long. You know, we'll figure that out. Um, it's actually not too bad. Maybe we just actually just, uh, uh, doesn't really work in tournament magic. Uh, add a row below. Oh, oops. Wait, whatever. Doesn't really work in tournament. Tournament magic. Doesn't isn't a word. Oh, I do this every time. All right. There we go. Good idea. Good idea, Sarah. Um, Marceline has brought up another really fun idea. What if we Mystic Forge? And I look at the top of my deck, and then I put the top on top, and then I cast the top, and then I, wow, we move the cards through all the zones. What fun. That sounds fun to me. I would have a good time doing that. I don't know if that's the most fun thing in the world to encourage. So, I think this one's just got to go, friends. Change the name of the second tier back. Oh, what was it before? I didn't realize it, it had done that. Uh, maybe if I just keep control Zing, it will fix it. Oh. Uh. What was it called before, chat? It makes what? Okay, thank you. Makes one deck, two OP. Okay, and then this one was. Doesn't really work in tournament magic. Alright. Second Sunrise, basically you, you would loop a bunch of things uh, over and over and it takes too long and it is a deterministic kill. And I think it doesn't really add much to the format from there. Uh, bye Spencer, I'll see you tonight, buddy. Thanks for stopping by. Alright. Skull clamp time. <laughs> Mm. 
Skull Clamp. Where does Skull Clamp go? Where is it? Well, if you've ever played with Skull Clamp, you probably know. It's too good. Um, Skull Clamp, actually, I think there's like some argument to like maybe there's some fun, exciting things you can do with Skull Clamp. Um, but what I said about top, I'll say about Skull Clamp, which is do you really think people are going to do that? I don't think so. I think it's just too risky. And um, there was like a category of like too risky, not worth it. That's sort of where this card would be, right? So I, I think if ultimately it would make one deck too good, I don't really know what it would be. I would guess an elves type deck. Um, but like Skull Clamp plus Saga, yeah, that seems really good. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, actually, you know what? Talking about Skull Clamp plus uh, Bowmaster makes this illegal. This is really good with Bowmasters, right? Like, imagine this. Once again, once again, we are playing the game of now you have to play a card. But regardless, we'll move past that for a second. Skull Clamp says, <laughs> sack the army, draw two cards. If your opponent's an idiot and decide to play Skull Clamp, kill them, murder them. Then you can also sack your Bowmaster, draw two cards. Your Yogg deck can sack the wolf, right? Equip it, draw two. Poggers. Equip it to my, tap my Halfling, put it on Halfling. Sack Halfling to Yogg. Minus counter on your thing, draw three cards. Probably not, not really worth it, right? Isn't really adding anything, doesn't really end up being a spot. Um, Death Right Shaman. Oh, Deathrite Shaman. Let me let me talk about Deathrite Shaman for a second. Because this motherfucker, this motherfucker gets so much of the argument. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to put it right here just to bait y'all for a second. Deathrite Shaman gets so much argument of, well, now we have Unholy Keep. And now we have Solitude. And now we have Prismatic Ending. And now we have Wayland Binding. And we have Ragavan. Ragavan has proven the format can survive a explosive early card. That sounds like so much fun. Why can't they let me have Deathrite Shaman? Oh, Deathrite Shaman would fix the Renin Six problem because Deathrite Shaman doesn't die to Renin Six. Doesn't that sound fun? Don't we all want to have to play Deathrite Shaman to fuck Renin Six? Isn't just playing a deck full of one twos fun? <laughs> uh, jokes aside, Deathrite Shaman does not. Just because we have all these new cards that could kill Deathrite Shaman, what if we learn together, class? That doesn't mean that we should unban Deathrite Shaman. Doesn't mean we get to have this, have this card come around and it just gets to live. Too good. It's too good. It's like Death Rite Shaman is unironically one of the best cards in Magic's history. Uh, it, it is literally one of the best cards, right? Uh, a lot of ways, like think about this. The Light Halfling has done really well so far. And you could argue the Can't Be Countered line rarely comes up. Right, Murktide exists, but we saw the Pro Tour. Um, the card Counterspell wasn't super played, and while I think Pro Tours are not a great example of how things actually play in the real world, I do believe that the Delight Halfling Can't Be Countered line is more flavor text than anything, but is a strong part, is a real part of the card and is strong, right? Cool. In Modern, right, this card is basically the same, but it also is randomly hate. For graveyard decks which you know that's not the end of the world but you know that's pretty good and it is really strong with fetch lands right if your opponent decides to play fetch lands death right charming gets them and it randomly just hoses decks like like burn it eat, eats a kill spell and, and doesn't eat a, a bo uh, like a searing blaze type card really you know gains you a good amount of life if you've done the mid game or whatever it just completely can solo them against other decks it just turns them off right so the card is really, really strong, and it's the best mana dork ever. Um, Death Rite Shaman is just too fucking good. It is just way too strong. Um, if Pioneer had the fetch lands, and if we ever get the fetch lands in Pioneer, which I don't think we would, <laughs> on Hinge Shaman, uh, <laughs> then I think we will see Death Rite Shaman be, spoilers, one of the best cards in Pioneer. It just doesn't have the enablers. Much like Treasure Cruise and Dig Through Time don't have the enablers. Yeah, it pitches to Grief and Endurance. 
It pitches to force a vigor. Right? I'm aware how the, the fetch lands are currently banned in Pioneer, Dave. Yeah. That is true, Valcaster. I will say that. It, while it is incredibly strong, it does not create games like these other cards do. Right? That, that is a good point, and thank you for bringing that up. Oko. You don't get to play with your fucking cards. Fuck you and die, idiot. These. Double mana. This. Extra mana. This. Extra mana. This. Extra mana. This. Fuck you and die for playing one drops. This. Kill you on the spot. Fuck you and die for trying to play. Blurs. Fuck you and die for trying to play fair magic. That's right, Shaman. Kind of just plays. Plays really well. Is really strong. But does just play. Right? You can just... The game doesn't end when Death Right Shaman. Or it doesn't warp things super dramatically. I also think there's going to be said about Death Right Shaman and its play patterns against Ren and Six being not to activate until they activate their Ren. That's a different conversation, though. Okay. Oh, well, you, you're a subscriber, so it's okay, Whiskey Dingo. You can have it, then. But only Whiskey Dingo. And you can only do Jund with four drop things. If y'all can all promise to just play Jund with four drops and Thun the Last Troll, you can have it back. Nice. Bloodbred Elf is back on the menu. I'm a pure soul you are, Whiskey Dingo. Mystic Sanctuary. Where does Mystic Sanctuary fall? Is it risky to unban, but maybe worth it? Is it fun to loop the same card over and over again? Is it fun to take the same game action over and over again, chat? Is that fun? Some would say yes. I would argue no. Mystic Sanctuary is also just too good. It is a... I was about to... Have to read the KCI discourse? Oh, you're so close, Matt. We're so close. I, I think Mystic Sanctuary is too strong. I think this is one of the ones that is, you know, probably... Uh, it's been a bit of time since this card's been around for a lot of y'all, right? I know a lot of y'all started playing during the pandemic um, and, you know, found the game, again, via Magic Arena, which is great. Mystic Sanctuary might not look to be too strong of a card. And in some ways, um, I think that, you know, it isn't. And it, you could bring it back. But I think things like Cryptic Command, where you sort of tap your opponent's team and just pick this up and, like, replay with a bobble, right? Those sort of play patterns are not super fun. And they're not super uh, endearing or something I think is a really great part of the format. It's not something I would really personally like to promote, right? So when it's been on the ban list, I think it's too good. Um, and I think it probably makes some decks not very fun. Uh, there are cool things, once again, we can do a Sanctuary, right? I think a lot of you are thinking about fun stuff you could do. Uh, but there's also things like Counterspell in the format now, right? And imagine, if you would, a world where I Counterspell you, and then end of turn, uh, and I have my DRC in play, and I end of turn fetch, put the Counterspell on top, and draw again, right? Wow, what fun. Everyone's having a fun time, you know? That sort of thing, it's endearing in the moment, and a lot of people look back on Oka Urza with a lot of, like, nostalgia, but Mystic Sanctuary is just kind of too good. I, I think, really, one of the things that I always thought was kind of strong and got not enough play because of the pandemic was Ren and Six Time Warp and Mystic Sanctuary, where you would play a Ren and Six, and you would, you know, protect it a little bit, you'd play a normal deck, and your deck just had, like, a couple Time Warps in the Mystic Sanctuaries, which you could use to get back normal interaction to make sure that, you you know, you're always making your land drops because you're a Ren and Six deck, and then you just put the interaction back on top. But if you had Time Warp, you would put Time Warp on top, cast Time Warp, go, 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 repeat with Mystic Sanctuary plus Fetchlands Ren and Six, and then, spoilers, your Ren and Six got to retrace the Time Warp, right? You would just start picking it up again. This is something we actually saw uh, BTCLA, better known as Baker, play at the Mox during the pandemic. He played that deck, and it was really good. And, like, his deck also had things like Uro in it. But, like, I think other players also played that deck, to be fair. I just, Baker's my friend. I know him personally and, like, was talking to him a bit during that tournament. So, for me, I think of Baker. I think uh, Oliver also played that deck or played a deck like it with Field of the Dead. Um, regardless, I don't, I don't want to make it seem like it's just Baker. But, like, that deck was really good. And, like, Mystic Sanctuary was just too much. And doesn't really add a lot of fun to the format. 
I think replaying the same card over and over again is too fun. So, that's not on that. For the sake of Matt Nass getting healthy, we'll talk about KCI. Doesn't really work in tournament magic, right? Uh, time from four color now because it's too good to ring. Yeah, I, I totally buy that. Thank you so much, uh, Andrew, for the subscription there. Nine months. Wow, that's a little sub baby. Yeah, it's something that, you know, uh, people also have tried playing Time Warp um, with Eternal Witness and Ephemerate back when that was a thing of four color, right? I got ninth at the GP Vegas doing that, right? Um, so, like, that's a thing that players have tried. And I, I think is like, not super fun. I think taking all the turns is just not, you know, super fun. Games do have to end, but not great. I, I think there's just a bunch of stuff with this that isn't great. Um, but, yeah, Time Warp plus the Ring is something that we streamed on this channel as well, where it's just like we tried putting a bunch of taking turn cards together with the ring. It was pretty cool. Um, anyways, KCI. So, it's we for, for starters, if it you know kind of banned makes one deck to OP, there's that going on, but doesn't really work in tournament magic. I think is where I would put it. I do think it is like makes one deck to OP, but we added this category and that this takes forever. And you know, there was a period where. <laughs> And the modern, I think this was the best deck for a while. And um, I, I've heard this story secondhand, and maybe Matt can confirm it. Uh, I've never actually talked to you about this, Matt. But a story I heard was that a bunch of players played KCI at the Pro Tour. I believe it was like Shaheen Sarani and yourself and a couple others. And then someone come over and told you about the Star Trek, right? Where it was a mana thing and you can respond and get your cards back. Um, and while I don't think you actually needed that to win at like an RCQ level, right? Um, a lot of the time. It was obviously helpful. It's better to know it than not. There was just things about this deck where players didn't understand and we didn't get it as a community. And then people like Matt Nass, Sam Pardee, Beckstrom. Uh, I feel like who was there was a fourth person that was playing this deck a lot? Oh, Shaheen. I just... Oh, it was Ely. Sorry, it was Ely Cassis who was playing the deck, I believe. Um, maybe they both were playing it? Doesn't really matter. Players figured the deck out, right? And then we started playing it and it was really, really strong and it took forever. And I don't think it really adds a lot of fun to the experience, right? I personally played KCI a lot. I really like KCI. I played the deck a bunch. I played it on Modo, and I didn't play the Amber Cool Kill. I played the normal loop pirate spell bomb kill you type stuff that you played in real life. I, like, did the work. It was really, really fun. It is one of the best decks I have personally ever played. Um, I don't know if it's the best deck I've ever played, but it's really up there. It is really strong and it takes forever. And when you have someone who's really proficient with it and goes really quick, it's not that bad of an experience, right? For example, uh, Sam, it was Ben White's. Okay, thank you. I, I, I don't know why I thought it was Ely. Maybe Ely started playing it later. Um, but okay, Ben White's. Thank you, Matt. But like, so for example, if any of those people Matt just mentioned, Matt himself, BK, Sam, Ben White's, any of them are playing it. Um, okay. Okay, gotcha. So that, that's the story. Now we have that saved. It'll be on YouTube and everything. Gotcha. That makes sense. Thank you, Matt. I've you played against any of them. Probably a pretty fast and good experience, right? They know what they're doing. It's like, okay, but even them, they're going to have to stop and think, and it's pretty methodical, pretty taxing to do. Um, like, doing it the wrong way at Phoenix, like, <laughs> illegally because it's so confusing. <laughs> <laughs> that's really funny that's a great story um but like you play against those players and they're like some of the most proficient players with the deck they're also some of the best players at the time right like there was a period during this era where like you know those players listed all were dominating and doing really really well right and like i like i remember there's just this period of time where those players listed where matt, matt just said in chat were like crushing modern gps and gps for all you new people are kind of like nrgs but bigger and they go to the pro tour um anyways jokes aside um i just think it doesn't really work in tournament magic it's cool i i like the card it was fun i am once again sympathetic to the modern doesn't have a lot of combo decks that aren't like creature based i agree i wish there were more but this is sort of the world we live in so now with Creativity Explorer, do you have any heuristics for when you change your threat package? Uh, the real quick thing is, Holebreaker Horror is good against uh, decks with counter spells, and a track is thing I bring in when my opponent's trying to grind me out or attack me to death. Yeah, Sam Black ruined it. Yeah, for you specifically, Samantha. 
Yeah. You know, and like, once again, I want those combo decks. If I was working at Wizards of the Coast, right, and let's say I had some high up position or whatever, I would be like, okay, I would like to figure out some way to create combo cards that are not solely creature combos um, and like put them in modern. If we're going to ham fist some stuff, let's ham fist this. I don't know. I don't have an answer for you. I don't know what I would do exactly. Um, I have some ideas, but I don't think that's what the stream is about. Really good for it. Yeah, it, it is really strong. Opal obviously made it over the line, but like maybe there's some Mox Amber shit, right? Like maybe Psy and Emery, you know, change the deck enough. I, I don't know. And I just sort of agree that's just like probably not something that we should safely unban. So, once again, everyone in chat, Mason here leaning back in his chair looking at the ceiling. I, I want some combo decks. Me want combo. I don't think unbanning Seething Song and Rite and this and Mox and Chrome. Like, I just don't think that's the answer. I don't think that's what we're going to get doing. So, we move on. Blazing Shoal. Blazing Shoal is another card. That I think sort of falls under the category of, well, Mason, we have a Unholy Heat and Prismatic Ending and Leyline Binding and Solitude and Fury. Why can't we have these cards, right? And, spoilers, when we get to the cards I would ban, I don't think they will ban, but I think you could ban Fury and Solitude, and your game would be more fun for some fun reasons, and we'll get to that, you know, in about 30 minutes. But, Blazing Shoal, right... I don't feel it like is really promoting fun games, right? Shoal is just hammer, and it just kills you out of nowhere. But I don't think this dying from hand free spell stuff is exactly what players are missing. And I saw something today that was like, I'm more worried about this card with Oliphant and Fury than I am Progenitus. I think those would just be cards in the Progenitus build, right? Um, this is just not really fun right i think this play pattern does exist we have hammer we technically have infect i do think infect is a little weak for sort of where we are in the current metagame but we have seen infect do really well at random points and you know i think if magic was a living card game where everyone had access to all the cards at all the time we might see more infect because it is really hard for players to switch decks right bigger fields big open fields high incentive high high incentive for you to sort of you know play good decks but open fields sort of bring everyone it's much harder to metagame close small field tournaments that are more exclusive you can get a lot more metagaming so for example in the mocks i believe it was juju bean and somebody played in fact i think their deck selection choice was great for that tournament it made a ton of sense those players are really smart. They figured it out. In a big open tournament, things are different. It's not just the best decks, right? Things are not the same. So, does pitch to Fury. That's right. So, I, I think Hammer is a more fun play pattern for everyone involved, has more counterplay, and is just overall a better experience. And we have the Blazing Shoal experience in Pioneer. You know, Disgruntle Elk. Have you ever built Infect Hammer? Ever put Glistener Elf in Blighted Agent with your Hammer deck? I'm sure somebody has. There's no way no one's done that idea. I can't be the first one to have it, right? So I bet you that deck would be pretty fun. And actually, I bet you that deck 5 is a leak if you play well. I don't really know if that's like the most fun thing. It's wildly uninteresting. Yeah, crazy. Who, who would have guessed? It's also probably not as good as normal hammer. Less all in, more resilient, play, play more games. Playing games and having your deck function is poggers. Do you know what's cool about Fable the Mirror Breaker? It makes you play, it lets you play the game. Sorry. It gives you your mana, it smooths your draw. It, that is strong. The backside and everything on rate, whatever, it's probably too much a little bit. But I don't think they're that far off from, like, a really perfect design. Uh, 
like Champion of Wits is a card that I've heard people promote for a similar reason because Champion of Wits, all of its power is in smoothing, right? It lets you play the game. You play it early, you just, you know, you loot some cards away. Late game, it gives you a mana sink. So if you're flooding out, you're not super dead. And if you're flooding out too, you can maybe hold lands. And there's some debate about, do I want to hold another one to guarantee discarding two lands? Or do I want to flash this back or do this thing, right? That's super cool. Those are cool. Putting points in fuck you die. Fuck you, you have to play Solitude. Fuck you, you have to play Fury. Fuck you, you have to play Unholy Heat. That sort of stuff, I don't think that's really all that fun. Yes, I agree. This is also a thing that I am pro Ragavan about. You know, we didn't talk about this too much at DRC. I sort of alluded to it. But Ragavan has to connect. It, it, it is a 2-1 that is very good. I'm not saying Ragavan's not good. I think Ragavan is better. It's like a really strong card and probably a stronger card than some of the cards on this list. Mm, like one on this list, maybe two. Um, but it has to connect, right? Ragavan... You see, that's blocked. It just dies. It doesn't. It doesn't always do its thing, right? And honestly, if Ragavan didn't have dash, I'm not sure if Ragavan would be the same level of problematic that we experience now. It would obviously be still really good. I'm not saying Ragavan's a bad card. I'm just saying the dash is really sort of over the line. So, anyways, that's where we're at. Also, I think the only reason Ragavan's a 2-1 because the OG Ragavan was a 2-1. Card should probably be a 1-1. One, one. That would be my alchemy Ragavan. All right. Dread Return. Where does Dread Return fall? Oh, we're starting to get to the spot where I need to move this chat thing. Oh, maybe I can just make the screen bigger. Hang on, hang on. I know what to do. There we go. Perfect. All right, we'll do this for now. Um, Dread Return. If you don't know Dread Return, it's a weird flashback spell where you sack some creatures to bring a creature back from the graveyard. Um, I am once again sympathetic to the we need some more combo decks in the format. I think Oops All Spells getting a big buff like this is not very fun and actually removes some of the charm of the deck it doesn't really add a lot to the format. Is that really fun? Is that really what we want to be doing? Is that really a good time? I don't think so. I really don't think that is like where I would want to spend my unbanned points. Um, and I think... Sorry, I just got a message I needed to respond to. Uh, so I looked at my phone. All right, hang on. One second. My throat is... Turns out when you talk a lot for an hour and 40 minutes, your throat gets a little dry. I drank a bunch of water while I was gone too, but. Yeah, back to you. Is this actually what we want? Is this the format we desire? Is this how we want things to go? I don't think so. I think Dredge Return doesn't really do much when it comes to adding to the format. Um. That's not tab. It's caffeine-free Coca-Cola. I uh, I am slowly but surely getting Coke out of my life. But I did just grab two of them because I was like, whatever. I got to talk a lot and didn't want to take time to fill up my water bottle and etc. But had no caffeine by the way for a year and a half or a year and a quarter. My bad. Closing on a half. Anyways, Dread Return doesn't really add much. I don't think there's much I can say. I'm sure you can think of fun things to do with this. I do not think it is worth adding to the format. Bridge from below. Where where does bridge from below? Oh, we start creating new lines. That's good. Um, where does bridge from below go? Well, I'd argue bridge from below isn't a fucking magic card sometimes. Oh, nice. I get to do this. Uh, can I, like, customize? Oh, what the fuck just happened? Uh... Uh, Alright, there we go. Whatever. Um, sorry, I'm trying to fix this. Bridge from below. Not really a magic card, right? Um, it doesn't do anything unless it's in the graveyard. And then you get rid of it by killing creatures, right? So it's like this weird sort of card. 
and you could argue doesn't really work in tournament magic isn't exactly where it belongs but it's like not really a magic card right and it does some cool things right if you for example have one of my favorite cards carrion feeder and grave crawler which is literally the reason it got me into like the idea of magic design and that sort of thing um then carrion feeder is kind of a uh sorry carrion feeder plus grave crawler is really cool with this you sack and you spend a mana and you get a zombie and there's a zombie horde rising up and that's really cool i would fucking love if zombies were a zombie focused deck was the thing people were doing in modern um but i don't think it is what people would actually do and you know while this card does work well with cards like grief right and the evoke elementals and yes the evoke elementals technically stop this card right we're back to the question of chat do we want everyone to be playing the evoke elementals do we really want to be like, hey, idiot, you didn't put subtlety in your deck? Dumbass. You didn't put solitude in your deck? Dump. Fury in your deck? Dumbass. Idiot. You gotta put those in your deck. Don't you know Bridge from Below is in the format? It's like, come the fuck on. Also, is anyone gonna actually do the fucking shit I'm talking about? Are they gonna actually play uh, like these sort of things? Is that, is that what we think is going to happen? Are people going to do the cool stuff? Are they going to carry and feed her with Champion of the Parish and Gravecrawler? Are they going to live my dream? No! They're going to fucking combo you with like Ultra of Dementia and bullshit like that. This is a card that exists because of Time Spiral. And it's just Mark Rosewater taking a hit of a doobie and going... What if he had an enchantment that only works in your graveyard? And then he passes it to some designer who's an intern handshaking it. They're like, Mark, what do you mean? <sighs> Takes a hit. Passes it back to Mark and he goes, put it in the file. And he goes, <sighs> yeah. Enchantment from the graveyard. And then like throws the doobie across the room. You know? That's Rich Rumble Up. It's not like a real card. This is like a, a make-believe person card. <laughs> you know? If the card had to actually be cast to work and then sacrificed itself, I would be more sympathetic from Bridge from Below. But it's a card that says, don't fucking play me. <laughs> it's just so stupid. I mean, it's not even like, I don't know. It is a cool card, right? And I'm joking about, you know, the doobie idea, but like, you know, it, it's, it, it's a cool card and that is like what Future Sight was, right? Future Sight was, here are a bunch of cool things. Some of these you'll never see. This is one of them. Yeah. It's a bridge from below deck. So, for the sake of the conversation, I think bridge from below would create a, like a new type of deck that it would only go in it. It's not like Oko or Luris or Deathrite Shaman, which go into all of the colors. Like those other cards do, I think this creates like a new thing. And I, I think arguably this card should be here. Where it's like you know, it goes in kind of all the stuff. But like I have it here for right now because I think it probably just makes one or two decks too good, you know what I mean? So um but yeah, it would help dredge, right? Uh, and it might create like new decks. Old Microsynth Lattice, better known as Microsoft Lettuce. Do y'all like Karn the Great Creator? Put a one in chat if Karn's your daddy, right? Bunch of twos, a bunch of twos, right? This card doesn't fucking do it. Like, okay, this card, this card is not the good guy. No one puts Microsynth Lattice in there. Here's something. Tell me what the fuck that card does outside of turning all the things into artifacts. I dare you. Right? 
Chat, chat's like, uh, it fixes mana, right? Okay. It's a six mana artifact that doesn't do anything. No one, here's the thing. With some of these designs, right? Like Sensei's Divining Top or um, this Mystic Forge or Skull Clamp or um, what was the other one we talked about? Death Rite Shaman. There are good guys and gal situations we can come up with, right? Where it's like, hey, this is something fun we could do. Let's do that, right? Rich from below. I just told you about. Imagine you imagine you go champion of the perished, and then you go carrion feeder, grave crawler, and then you play like citrus supply and you mill, or maybe you discard it off some card, right? And then you do all these cool zombie shit. That's fucking dope. Yeah, that shit's rocks. That's so cool. If I could let some fucking twelve year old kid at FNM be the only person to play with that exact deck for the rest of the time. Fuck yeah, that'd be cool. In reality, that ain't the shit that really happens. Microsoft Lattice... <laughs> sorry. Microsoft Lattice, not Microsoft Lattice. My, uh, Microsoft Lattice... I, can't, I always want to call it Microsoft Lattice. Microsoft Lattice here doesn't have that. No one's like, oh god, I had such a cool deck. No! Motherfuckers want to lock you out with Karn. And this is a kink-free... There's no kink-shaming here. If you want to get locked up by Karn, hell yeah, go off. One in the chat or one in the YouTube comments if you want Karn to lock you up. That's great. Hell yeah. I'm so happy for you. But the fucking rest of the world ain't like that. We, we don't want to just stop playing because Karn, the motherfucking great creator, just got put into play. And I don't fucking care if I can evoke Fury because Microsoft doesn't let you do that. All cards that aren't on the battlefield spells and permanents are colorless. You can't even invoke your fury. So you motherfuckers that have been replying with fury, fury kills it. Who cares? No, it doesn't. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. You don't get to do anything. We just lock people out. It's not fun. Tangle Wire, one of my favorite cards in Magic. Talked about at the beginning of the stream. I love Tangle Wire. I find it really fun. I have and will continue to take Tangle Wire early in cube over power because I have fun playing with Tangle Wire and I would rather have fun with Tangle Wire than have an Ancestral in my deck or Lotus or a Mox. Even though I knew I could probably wield a Tangle Wire, it is more fun to me to play with Tangle Wire. So, I am sympathetic to that. Let's move on. Old Dig Through Time, our first of the Delve spells. Too good. <laughs> yeah, you can do that. You can either have Carnivore Creator or Lattice. You can't have both. So, Dig Through Time. Ah. <sighs> What a world. Uh, the, the ban list is a week from today. The BNR update. It is on uh, August 1st, I think. Oh, sorry, uh, August 7th, I believe. Yeah, we need more Tangle Wire and Modern. That's what I want. So, dig through time. Oh, golly me. Golly gee willikers, dig through time. You know, if... Once again, there are a lot of fun things you can do with Dig Through Time. But I think the fetch lands subsidize the cost of Delve spells too much. We've seen this with Murktide Regent. It isn't really a cost. And we've seen what happens when these cards exist without Delve spells. They're not too good. They're just fine. In reality, Dig Through Time is, you know, sort of a, a card where it's like, hey, we can either ban the Delve spells or we can ban Dig Through Time. I'm sorry, I uh, banned the, the fetch lands where we can ban Dig Through Time. Magic, I think, is more fun with the fetch lands than it is with Dig Through Time. So, um, I think it's just not really worth it. This, like, enables combos too much. It's too low cost. All that stuff going on. Someone brought up in chat, is it better than the One Ring? I don't think it is... It is probably a little bit better than the One Ring. I would argue it is different. The One Ring does a lot of different stuff. And spoilers, I am pro-banning the One Ring. And I will talk about that in about 20 minutes. 
uh, once we finish this list because we're gonna go over the what I would unban list as well. So with that, well, sorry, what would I would ban list after we're done with this unban list. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. I'm not gonna be able to talk after today. Um, maybe I should go get some water. No, I'm gonna finish this. Okay. Dig through time, just too good. Enables combo decks too much and it's just different than the one ring, right? Uh, the one ring sort of generates raw cards and buys you time, um, all that sort of stuff. That is great. Dig through time gives you access to specific cards right away and enables combos immediately. Um, honestly, I wish we had dig through time. I fucking love inverter and inverter and modern would literally be a dream set. So dig through time is just too good. Gives you access to too many cards. And you think that like, I am sympathetic to the part that dig through time is at least not the most unfun play pattern, right? Once again, all these cards say fuck you and die for not playing us. These two do not. These are just really high rate cards. Um, you can make an argument that it's like risky to unban, but maybe worth it. I think it's not with the fetch lands. It's just taking away too much space in blue decks and doing things like dig through time and response, find subtlety or force negation. I just, I, I don't think that's exactly where I want to be. All right. So, all right, it's looting time. So, at the beginning, I told y'all there were five things that I think you're going to be pretty mad at me about. The first one I went over was Birthing Pod. The second one, Faithless Looting. Where does Faithless Looting belong? Is it safe to unban with no worries? Is this a card that's going to enable a lot of fun innovative strategies that are really cool and not going to be a big enabler for dredge and other combo decks and be above rate and be a problem is it going to be a little risky you know we got some things we talked about like phoenix and whatnot that you know now are gonna be too good i don't know it's pretty fun it works with tournament magic but does it make one deck too good you know is this just hey arclight phoenix would be too good a deck you know What's happening? You Yeah, you discard two cards. You're just moving through cards. You're not even casting cards. You know, you're, you're never up cards. Even when you uh, flash it back, you're just even on cards. Wow. There's so much going on. Is it just too good at enabling things, though? It just has to be over here, like off screen. Where does Faithless Looting land? Because you can see it in a lot of spots. Well... My answer is, I think Faithless Looting is too good. Um, there's a lot going on with looting <laughs> that we need to talk about. So I'm going to put it up here. I would argue if I could create more categories, I might just be the mixed one deck two OP. But I think Faithless Looting just goes in too many decks and does too many things that aren't super great. So for starters... I guess I should just put it here at the Astral. Like, if Astrolabe's here, then, like, maybe this needs to be here. Um, so, let, let's, let's address chat, because I knew, I knew y'all wouldn't like this. So, Faithless Looting is risky to unman, but maybe worth it. It's maybe a fair thing to say, right? Maybe you can put it here, and you could be like, yeah, you know, like... It's risky and there's some problems. <laughs> Bob, I only can create so many tiers. Um, and, you know, Faithless Looting is really fun, right? We've talked a lot about fun on this list so far. And I think Looting is one of the more objectively fun cards we've talked about, right? All of these fucking cards in the top row until we get to, you know, about... Birthing Pod, Luris, D, a Deathrite Shaman, Dick Through Time. These cards are all pretty unfun, right? A lot of these cards are, you know, fun for some people, but not everyone. But this is the first one. This is the first one where it's like, okay, what's going on, right? Is this actually fun, right? 
I, I think probably, right? Like I think Faith is looting is probably pretty fun for a lot of players. And it is something that a lot of people enjoy. Arclight Phoenix is one of the most loved decks in modern history. And I think one of the best, best decks of all time. If you're gonna have a deck be the best deck and what everyone is gunning for, Arclight Phoenix, thumbs up, pretty good. You could have, have clear goals on how to attack it, right? I think this is a big problem with Scam right now and a problem with Four Color last summer, where how do you attack Four Color in the Yorion days, right? How, what, do you, what do you do? Blood Moon doesn't work. It's not actually a plan, right? It doesn't actually get you anywhere. It's just a beatable card, okay? Are there any specific hate cards you can play? No, not really. There weren't really things you could do. You could play Cavern of Souls with Ty uh, Tiny Cavern of Souls. That was good, but it wasn't even a foolproof plan. I personally played against that deck a lot and had a bunch of main deck dress downs and was able to beat that matchup, right? It wasn't a foolproof plan. You had to play different decks to beat uh, four color, which is really what you're getting at, Bash. Um, is, hey, you can play Scape Shift and Belcher and these things. What has happened time and time again with Magic players is when we say you can beat this deck, you just have to play a new deck or you just have to do something different, players on mass won't shift. They will on Magic Online. They will for the mocks, right? Will Kruger, friend of the stream, won a mox playing Time Shift because he knew three of his like eight person tournament was going to be playing four color. Thumbs up. Almost lost to Death Shadow still, but thumbs up. You can do those things. Phoenix gives you clear goals. Graveyard hate is good against me, right? Limiting spells per turn is good against me. Tax effects are good against me. Those are all good. Like, thumbs up, right? Those are all things that Faithless Looting is kind of pushing towards. Same with Dredge, right? Dredge is like, all right, graveyard hate, you know? But it really puts a lot of pressure in it, and it's just too much. Mm -hmm. Time ship. Yeah, time ship's not super good against aggro. Um, just kind of kill them, right? And you don't have much interaction because your deck's sort of linear. Um, look at him. Sheesh. <laughs> but looting was fine for so long, but design has changed. Also, fine is a relative term, right? Looting was one of the best cards in modern for a while. Sometimes it just needs to be set up. We also have reanimator decks now. As Chad's bringing up the exact moment, we're going to segue. Let's go, chat. Good teamwork. Turn one, faithless looting. Turn two, persist is really strong. Do you know part of the reason we have persist in modern? Because we don't have faithless looting, right? That is something that maybe... Our good friends, the Solitude and Leyline Binding Police can come tell us about. Hey, Mason, do you know Solitude and Leyline Binding's around? Hey, Mason, I know you made $20,000 playing four color. Did you know that Solitude and Leyline Binding exist? Hey, Mason, you were the first four color player to put Leyline Binding in your deck. Have you ever heard of Leyline Binding? That is like, you know, it's like, oh, that's super cool. Great. Awesome. Great. Do we want to promote those things? So I, I think there are a lot of bad things that can happen with Faith of Looting. And <coughs> listen, I am sympathetic to looting more so than most of these cards we've talked about, right? I get it. There are some really fun things. And if we could only do some of the fun things and we didn't have to deal with the actual repercussions of it in the world... I'd green light it, but that's not the world we live in, right? Faithless looting is just too much. So, just because Solitude and Leyline Binding are magic cards, what does it mean, chat, when we see Solitude and Leyline Binding? It just means it's okay. We don't have to worry about it. 
It doesn't mean we get to unban things. It doesn't mean these things should happen, right? It's okay. Now, I personally would never unban looting for at least another five years. Maybe it is in this category in reality. I'm a little spooked by it. I don't want to have it. My list, my rules. Punishing fire. Where does punishing fire go? Because guess what it is, gang? It's time to talk about solitude, fury, and holy heat. Prismatic ending and fury. Leyline binding to hey Mason. Didn't you hear about these cards too? My name is Brian Kipler, and I tweeted about this earlier today. Death. Right? So, where is Punishing Fire? Where does it go? Mason, did you know about Unholy Heat? Did you know about these cards? Right? Do you think Grove of the Burning Willow plus Unholy Heat or Punishing Fire is, like, actually, um, like, strong? Did you know that's a thing you can do? So, this is an interesting one. Where I think the truth lies somewhere between these two. Where I do think current modern is um, probably not even the end of the world if Punishing Fire gets released. But, 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 I think there's something about downward pressure. And if y'all will stay with me, we have about 15 more cards to go through. And I'm going to tell you about what I would ban from modern. I think once you hear what my ban list would be, my conservative ban list, this will make more sense to you. But it's just not very fun. And it puts a lot of downward pressure on creatures. All right, all right. Here's a good, here's a good example. Here's a good example. Everyone in chat who can, close your eyes and think about what it takes to be a playable creature in modern these days with the cards Fury, Solitude, Leyline by name. Prismatic getting and Holy Heat. Bolt, Fatal Push, existing, right? What does it take? What is the barrier, right? ETB matters. You just have a strong enough stat line that can survive Renin 6 as well, something we haven't really talked about, right? But notably, Renin 6 on the decline in modern, Orcish Bowmaster's on the rise. Bowmaster kind of responds to lots of things, but really it's a hate card for the ring, right? And it's like good in one of the best decks right now. But Renin 6 is unequivocally... One of the best cards in Modern. You can make a strong argument. Ren Sist, Ren Sist should be on this list. Right? X1s um, are really, really punished right now. And a good way to sort of, I think, design around this is to put a second toughness on cards. And I have someone who can vouch for that. Do you know... If we go to our good friend Scryfall, as I'm doing here, it won't pull up. All right, well, Scryfall won't pull up. So, whatever. Delighted Halfling, right? Sort of is proof of this design philosophy. If you add another toughness, then things can live through Lava... Yeah, Lava Dart actually was a hugely oppressive part of Modern for a while, right? It really put a, a cap on what you could and couldn't do. Um, and if you add a toughness... That's a way to do it. But now we're talking about toughness creep because it's not power creep, it's toughness. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba. No, but jokes aside, um, if you up the toughness, I think you're really sort of heading down a dangerous path, right? And we're sort of saying, okay, exactly. Bowmaster should have been a one, two, that masses for two. Exactly, Mercy, you get it. Uh, but no, but like the one, two creature is like sort of the bar now, right? Like, Delighted Halfling, over half the time, makes a colorless mana, right? But the fact that it's a 1-2 buckaroo means you can play it. And yes, if it was just a 1-2 that made colorless, it probably would not see play outside of Eldrazi decks. But that's not what it does. I think Punishing Fire, long as we're around, is upping that barrier for what a card can be even more. And I really don't think Punishing Fire, Grove of the Burning Rillows is a actually fun play experience. That's right. Thraben Inspector is a card we should be moving more to. 
because you can pop the clue and your Thraven Inspector doesn't die. Think about it. Well, Darren Epicure doesn't work that way. Regardless, Punishing Fire really is chat. I think putting a lot of pressure on the format. And listen, I want to make this very clear. I have a lot of respect for Brian Kibler. I think he's one of the best minds in Magic through history. He's done a lot of innovative stuff. I listened to Kibler talk about card reviews in Hearthstone, and I barely fucking play Hearthstone. I think he has a really good mind for game design, that sort of stuff. And I would love to talk to Kibler one-on-one about why he thinks this is okay. So I, I know I sort of jokingly early on said, didn't you see Kibler or whatever. Um, I have a lot of respect for him. I just disagree with him on this point. I just don't think this is very fun. I don't think it really adds a lot. And yes, could we add it? Probably. But should we add it? Is that actually what we want them to see? Do we want Wizards of the Coast to see the, the Kibler tweet and be like, you know, players seem to want it, right? You know what I mean? Like, is that actually fun? Is pushing all the creatures to die and have this higher barrier what we want? I don't think that is true. Now, I think this is debatable. I don't think it is. I don't think, for example, I'm 100% right and Kibler is wrong, or if you're in chat, I don't think there's much argument about this. Or, I'm sorry, I think there's a lot of argument to this. Unlike a card like, I would argue, Chrome Mox or Oko, where if you try to tell me Oko in its current form should be in Modern, I would be very impressed if you could convince me that that is what it should actually be. Right? So, that's my punishing fire. I'm sorry, chat. Wow, water is fucking broken. Quick second to say this stream is sponsored by water. It's in your tap. Click the pose. Wow, that was some good water. It's almost gag time. We're going left to right at the bottom here, chat. Once again... Yeah, I'm gonna sell out. I'm gonna sell out the big water. Uh, if you want your card to be read early, you can always subscribe. But we're gonna go through all the cards today. So, ah, uh, yes, Field of the Dead. You made my beloved Amulet Titan so strong. What is going on? What is? Ha I promise you, there are cards that are safe to unban. Mage, I'm getting to them. I have cards I want to put there. We just haven't got there yet. But I will say this. I'm going to put this here. There is some truth to I am fucking tired of seeing tweets and not being able to have a real conversation. And this lets me do it. I think it's fun. So. Also, I really like thinking about design and play patterns and player experience. Uh, especially new player experience. That is something that is very important to me. So, we're going to get to JIT and Hypergenesis. Don't worry. We're going to talk about those. If you want me to talk about them sooner, you can always subscribe. If not, we'll come to you in a second. So, Field of the Dead. I think Field of the Dead is too good, unfortunately. Because I think there is a lot of really good design work going on with Field of the Dead. Uh, the, the burr noise? The blah, 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 blah. I believe that's what it was. Party time, Austin. Thank you for the follow. I should make that my new subscription noise. When I, we'll, we'll take this clip, I go, blah, 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 and it'll pop up every time someone subscribes. That will actually get people to do it. Yeah, that that's the noise when people tell me, hey, guess what? Leyline Binding Solitude's in the format. You can unbrand this strong creature. Hogax, fine. There's Leyline Binding Solitude. Even when we be that good. Blah, 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 blah. That's what you fucking sound like to me. No. I'm sorry. Sometimes chat. I, this is probably a good thing to note. If I start yelling and going over the top, I'm kind of in character mode. I'm in esports mode. If I'm talking to you like this, I'm an adult. I'm a human. I'm a mason. But when you tell me like, oh, Solitude's so good. It fucking, you can have Hogak now. I think you're like a fucking idiot. <laughs> you know, it's just like, it's just like, whatever. Anyways, um, not every deck has Solitude. So, all uh, right. I think Field of the Dead is really cool, though. So the thing I like about Field of the Dead um, is, like, the playing with different lands idea is really cool. I think with the fetch lands and fucking stupid-ass snow-covered lands and everything, and already this move towards five colors and four-color decks 
it would just be too easy. For example, um, if you were to just add this to my four color Yorion deck from last summer, right? I would change no cards and I would trigger Field of the Dead very easily. You just naturally play all the shocks, some fetches. Uh, try and thank you so much, May. Yes, we can. May, you do let me jump the line if you want because you subscribe. Let me know if you want to let me jump the line on something. Um, but Field of the Dead just would naturally go in there. So while this is a card that I think is really cool, in theory, I think in practice it doesn't actually play out really well. Although I love the idea of Field of the Dead. It's one of the cooler designs. And just this really interesting, like, okay, how do I build this deck? What is the challenge? How do I go about it? I love that idea. I think it's just a little too good. Um, I think there are a lot of ways you could print fixed Field of the Dead. Um, but, you know. Sweet. Awesome. Thank you for the subscription. With Prime. Twitch Prime. All right. That's it for Field of the Dead. I don't think we really need to talk about it. Uh, I know this is a card that probably a lot of you missed during the uh, Magic Arena era and during the pandemic, but it is really good. If you ever get it, by the way, if you're ever drafting your cube and you didn't believe me on Oko, Looting, Field of the Dead, Luris, Deathrite Shaman, Dig Through Time, just just draft them. Just draft them in a high-powered cube. You'll understand. Uh, it's like a new type of deck slash dredge decks. Yeah, we already did the, the Artifact Lands. Yeah, so they just eat up so much real estate on the screen that we just have this one up here to represent all five. Uh, when I take the, the screenshot for Twitter, I'll put all five up there. But, sorry. All right, Yorion. Uh, safe to unban with no worries, I promise. XD? No, uh, Yorion is too good. Um, I, I don't even, like... It's, it's funny because you could argue it makes one deck too OP with four color, but I think it's just actually too good. Um, so here's the thing about Yorion, and this is the thing I think most of us didn't get when we first saw it, right? <laughs> is that we, I, I, there's a podcast episode of me saying, of all the companions, I think Yorion is the coolest and the best because it tells you to do... I think I said it in Lutri technically, but it in Lutri tell you to do the, the weirdest things in deck building, right? All one of her spells, uh, 20 extra cards. That's really cool. And in theory, Yorion actually makes your deck more inconsistent and worse because you have more cards in your deck. You've thickened your deck. In reality, what Yorion actually says is it doesn't say add 20 cards. It says... Increase your lands by about six to seven, and then add four cantripping one mana cards that are permanents, right? So Abundant Growth um, was the one that was played in Modern, which really means you have room for about nine more cards, right? That is really what Yorion said, because you needed to have... Um, we're going to get to that, I, I promise, um, with the dexterity issues. But part-time awesome. Thank you so much for the subscription. With Twitch Prime, thank you so much. This is my full-time job, and it's great to have... Support like that really helps. Um, Yorion. Uh, I need to put exclamation point coach. I gotta set that up. I keep forgetting to. Uh, anyways. Um, anyway, if you listen to this, I do coaching full time. That's my job. Plus one. Click on my Twitter link below. It's my pinned tweet right now. Uh, anyways. Um, Yorion just adds a little bit too much with ETBs and flickering stuff. It's actually really, really strong to have the flicker. Hey, Sam. Did I say your name? Sam? Sam is Sami. Your name is kind of weird. Thank you for subscribing with Prime. Really helps a lot. Thank you so much. Um, but Yorion, just the flickering, actually, with the ETBs and stuff, is a little too good. Um, it's funny. I know we've talked a lot about... Um, yeah, we... You, well, I'll, I'll bump Twin up. There you go. Um, so, and once again, if you subscribe, you're, you're hard to get bumped on the list and we can talk about it. Um, so... Yorion just, the ETB stuff is too strong. And I know I've talked a lot about Solitude, Leyline, Binding, jokingly. But unironically, they are very strong with Yorion. Like, being able to Leyline, Binding, um, a legendary thing, and then Flicker when they play the new one is very strong. Uh, Leyline, Binding down an early threat to just save life, and then Flicker it on a stronger threat later is very good. Leyline, Binding a token, then resetting to kill another token, or to kill a, another permanent is really strong. That's all very, very good. 
Um, uh, I'll answer that in the second part of time, Austin. But long story short, um, Yorion is just too good. It just provides too much value, and being the eighth card in your hand is already pretty strong. And it's in one of the better colors, white being one of the stronger cards. Solitude, I sort of believe, is like our force of will. Um, like, if you look at the format and you look at kind of like gates on it, Modern has become a lot more like Legacy as time has moved on. And I believe Solitude plays our force of will wall. For, <laughs> force of will wall. Force of will roll. <laughs> I butchered that one there. Um, and Yorion just gives you too much. We didn't talk about this much with Luris because I think Luris is so obvious, but Yorion really kind of needs to be hammered home, I think. Um, yeah, there's a lot of fetching of niche cards and redundancy. And also, this is a real part of Yorion that I, I thought was going to be able to be fixed without Yorion and really hasn't. And this is why you see the four-color lists look a lot more like elemental lists now than they do like the controlling list, which, you know... For transparency, I think a lot of you know who I am in a much more real way because of Yorion, right? Um, if we look back at sort of the last year and a little bit for me personally, um, doing well at Vegas in November with Yorion really like catapulted me into a lot of people's radar. And then winning DreamHack really put me on the map for a lot of people. Uh, and like I had like a pretty decent sized following and all that before, but like it really changed with Yorion. And I played Yorion a lot. And a lot of people know me as, like, the four-color guy, right? So, like, yeah, exactly. And so it's just, like, this is a card I'm... <laughs> exactly. Yeah, this is a card I'm intimately familiar with. And I, I've played with a lot. Um, and there was this idea that I kind of had that my friend Abe Stein sort of gave a word to it, which was answer density. The four-color decks were... What they did is they took those nine extra cards... And they added, like, just... Because we talked about, like, you fill them up with lands and cantripping things, like Abundant Growth. And we just added a bunch of answer spells. So, my deck was 20 cards bigger. But mathematically, I actually had more answers than a deck like Blue White Control did. Right? Like, if you ran the numbers, it just actually ended up being, oh, shit, I am mathematically more likely to have a turn one Ragavan answer than Blue White Control or Murktide, etc., and the way the deck worked is you would just run people out of resources and then kill them. This is why Emrakul the Promising was so good back then, because everyone had a million answer spells. And so if you could just use all the answer spells up, even if Emrakul didn't stick around, that was really, really, really strong. Um, caused me to be the monster I've become. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I remember yeah, uh, Abe telling me about that story. But, um, you know, like, Jorion would just kill everything right that was sort of the way it uh worked so thank you all by the way so much for the follows it's awesome uh you all rock um but yorion just is over the line we can talk about it more um yes that that is blazing shoulder dig i'm sorry the oh no i grabbed the wrong thing ah there we go i th i, I want to keep the the twitch shout out for the youtube vod if you're watching on YouTube, it's going to be better. I'm sorry for everyone watching on Twitch. Uh, that is Shoal Under Dig. I, I can't really fix it. Um, I, mean, I can try doing this. I guess this... It is, has a lot, adds a lot of dead space, but it's fine. Um, I'm going to add a heart emoji. <laughs> Anyways. Um, okay, this is good. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 I'm not in love with it, but it's fine. It's better for y'all. That's what matters. Um, so... Are there any non-storm considerations to keeping Seething Song? Uh, yeah, I, I just like Belcher. That sort of stuff, Savage. Um, this will all be up on my Twitch VOD. You can go back and rewatch this. Um, or you can wait till it comes up on YouTube probably tonight. I, I might not actually edit much out of this except just like the break stuff. Um, but we'll see. Uh, depends on sort of how these games. Splinter Twit may put this to the front of the line. Let's talk about it. So... Mentioned at the start of the video, there were five cards y'all were going to hate me for. Five cards. That I was pretty sure when I went into this, I was going to get a lot of pushback on. Birthing Pod, Faithless Looting, those were two of those cards. 
The third card is Splinter Twin. So where is Splinter Twin land? Is it safe to unban? I don't know if you all have heard. There's Unholy Heat and Fatal Push and Prismatic Ending and Leyline Binding and Solitude and some more kill spells. There's a lot of kill spells. You know, that's a lot going on there. So maybe it's just a little risky, right? But maybe it's worth it. There's a lot of there's a lot of really strong stuff. Sure just wins the game immediately. And sure, it is one of the most loved cards in modern history, right? But is it safe to unban? Right? Where does it fall? Is it here or is it here? Where where does it lie? Because you know, it's definitely not too good, right? Right? It couldn't be too good. It's a four mana enchantment. You have to tap out against the Solitude, Leyline, Binding, and Holy Heat. Bolt format. Right? That's crazy. Where where does it land? Is it risky? Or is it safe? I think it makes the living uh, the Splinter Twin sort of tempo deck too good. So I think it should say banned. And I am sure this is the spot where a lot of people get mad at me. Um Ooh, I feel like I missed someone's message I was supposed to talk about. Um, anyways. I, I, I do want to unban. We're getting dangerously close to a card I want to unban. A card I want to unban is from the Preordain over. One of these cards I want unbanned. What card is it? Who knows? Maybe it's multiple cards. We'll get there. But Splinter Twin, I, I think, is just... Not a very fun play pattern, right? So, yeah, I know chat's, chat cares less about Splinter Twin now, and they're like, go on, tell me about this unban, Mason. And listen, I will say this about the Splinter Twinners. We've talked a lot about being sympathetic to combo decks. I love that I lost like 20 people when I banned Splinter Twin. That's so funny. Um, there's a lot going on with Splinter Twin, right? And Splinter Twin is, like, pretty fun. A lot of people like playing that Izzy sort of tempo combo finish. That is really fun for a lot of players. It is also really unfun for a lot of players, right? And this is sort of a, a constant thing we bump into, right, when we're talking about stuff. Thank you so much, Nicole, for the subscription. I am so hyper. Hypers. Um, where... Splinter Twin, and we talk about fun, right? Like, well, one camp really likes it, the other camp doesn't. That's true of a lot of decks, right? We could talk about Scam in Modern. We could talk about Tron in Modern. We could talk about a uh, Hammer in Modern. There are a lot of decks where we could say, hey, didn't really have a lot of fun there. But those decks aren't banned right now, right? And when we take a card off the ban list, right, we are now really entering some interesting sort of okay what's going on what do we uh like is this going to actually be net fun because once again i said about an hour ago if we unban a card and we have to reban it in the next two years i think that's a, a big egg on the face moment right not very good it's not a good look um i think personally that if it's like five six years down the road that is okay for us to reban a card um, because, you know, a lot changes or whatever, design change or whatever. It's not as big a deal. Players got to play with it for a half decade. That is six years, by the way, we're, we're thinking about is longer than most AAA video games are around, right? Like, no one plays Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 anymore. They play, like, the remastered one, right? Um, so... Uh, fencing brick literally Yorion last summer. Uh, anyways, Splinter Twin just sort of puts us in an interesting position where I think for a lot of players, much like Birthing Pod, Splinter Twin sort of how would I describe this? Just killing someone right away and creating that experience of the game is over. I don't think is very satisfying for a lot of players, and I think that's why we've seen a move away from promoting strong combo decks in Magic and a move towards a lot of interaction, right? And playing back and forth, back and forth sort of games that are dynamic um, are really like 
more casually, like, it just kind of has a broader appeal. Um, and Splinter Twin sort of does that until the exact moment it doesn't. And I think what Splinter Twin actually does is it's incredibly taxing on weaker and new players in a way that a lot of other decks are not. Right? When you have Splinter Twin um, sort of in the format, uh, players like, how do I describe this? They just sometimes die, and then they also just sometimes, like, don't play the game because they're so afraid of losing. And the answer plan doesn't really work. We talked about this before. When I can give you a clear answer for a card or a, a, a problem, I think that's a pretty good type of problem to be having. So, for example, um, let's say the problem is a uh, graveyard deck that's all in on the graveyard, like Arclight Phoenix, right? I mentioned that was a good problematic best deck. Um, in that world, I can, I can tell you the cards to play, right? You can play Rest in Peace and Tormont Script and um, Soul Guide Lantern and Surgical Extraction and Leyline of the Void and uh, the Trap and blah, 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 blah. There are so many things, right? Against Twin, the answer is kind of, hey, play removal. Except that doesn't really work, right? Because the Twin decks historically were really good at sort of dodging around that, right? And sort of playing a uh, real game. So I personally think that you could unban, unironically, I think, that maybe it's risky to unban, but not worth it is really where this one comes. I think that is uh, risky to, un to unban. You maybe could, but not really worth it. I think that is sort of where the answer to Splinter Twin actually lies. I'm just going to change this category because I think there are some other cards that are sort of coming in this way. And this is going to actually lead us to a more realistic list. Um, anyways, Splinter Twin, I can see some strong arguments for. Um, I think there are worlds where we could have Splinter Twin. I think in the reality, we are really changing what Modern is about. Um, and even though Splinter Twin is not the best deck, or even that strong of a deck in No Bandless Modern, that is very different than normal Modern. And I know that I sort of... Um, cited cards like I have Ugin when having that conversation that was more to say in a world where everything is legal I have Ugin is on top and Splinter Twin in the world where uh everything is legal sort of on bottom but it's like the bottom of the best you know what I mean and I think it kind of comes in in the upper part of the metagame so yes there are a lot of kill spells yes there is a lot more interaction force negation is a thing the Black Force is a thing, right? Like Force of uh, Vitality or whatever it's called. The Black Force from MH1. That one is in the format. There are a lot of things you could do. I personally just think it's not worth the risk. Force of Despair, thank you. Um, I don't know where I got Vitality from. Yeah, Vigor hits it too. Uh, Eractos Charm, right? Like these are things players did. And, you know, playing Rakdos Charm is not like a... You did it. People don't play Rakdos. You know what I mean? Like, the, the argument of, like, Binding and then Solitude and Friends are, like, much stronger to me because those are cards that are already played and don't ask a ton of you. Rakdos Charm is a card in your sideboard that's, like, basically just for this matchup. And you might find other weird fringe uses, but it's not really a card that's up to snuff. And I think it's really hard and unfun and unfair to ask players to move the cards like Rakdos Charm consistently forever. And if you ban... Splinter Twin in the next two years after you unban it, it is a super big egg on your face. So, not really worth it. Not now. I think we could someday see Splinter. I, here, here's what I would say. If the modern format is at a low when it comes to engagement on sales, players, and everything, they will unban Splinter Twin. Because there is no card that would get players back in the trenches and excited about the format for a short little period of time at least quite like splinter twin it is sort of it, it is like a close card to be unbanned right like this is like the one with the most nuance i think and sort of like why i've waffled the most and changed the category because a card like birthing pod it's not a debate that card has to be fucking banned like it is too good 
That is just obvious. Splinter Twin, there is some counterplay and there are some good arguments that you can be made. I think this is also why you see Aaron Forsyth tweet, we've talked about unbanning Splinter Twin, we don't talk about unbanning Birthday Pod. Um, I think the general power would just need to go up a good bit. I, I think we just need to be having more kills and that are happening earlier and Modern is actually like a fairly grindy format despite um, like in the real world at least uh, despite so the perception it has it's like a super fast kill format so give it 10 years I bet this card's unbanned in 10 years yeah alright I don't know what Bash is Bay talking about. All right. Glimpse of Nature. Where does Glimpse of Nature fall? Way less than 10 is a lot. That's all I'm saying. Uh, Glimpse of Nature. Where does this fall? Sort of a cool combo card. Works with creatures. Let's just sort of plow through your deck. Let's just skip the BS and get onto it. Glimpse of Nature is too good. Um, I think if we want to make elves a thing, we can sort of do that. If we want to, you know, like have cool creature engine combo decks, we could do that. This is just not where I want it. And as much as I love Glimpse, elves is one of my favorite legacy decks. Um, I own legacy elves and I'm really excited to play that and I love playing Glimpse. I think it is sort of too solitary and doesn't lead to super fun games and just overpower stuff and... I'm not, I'm not about it. Yeah, it working with the vote creature is pretty funny. Mm-hmm. I'm aware of Samantha, but I still play it in my deck. Because that's a make-believe format. Legacy is a four-fun format. Because of Bowmaster. Well, they don't play it because of Bowmaster and other stuff, too. But I would just play it still. Because I like it. You know what I mean? If I was trying to win a Legacy tournament, I wouldn't play Glimpse. But whatever Mickey Mouse format that's right Golgari Grave Troll where does Golgari Grave Troll van? they unbanned it and they had to reband it that's because Golgari Grave Troll is too good here's a way to think about Golgari Grave Troll it is a zero mana draw six nobody plays Golgari Grave Troll for good reasons right no one's like oh wow Golgari Grave Troll, I can do so many cool, unique things with this. No. Motherfuckers, just do it with Dredge because it's the best Dredger. It's just a draw six, right? These two cards on top of each other, this is just fucking, you know, a marriage, right? This shit is too strong and doesn't really add a lot of texture to the format, right? I understand that Dredge is not very good right now. I am aware right that dredge doesn't currently um do very good and people sort of make fun of it i personally call it worse naya zoo right it just uh puts a bunch of creatures in the format gets in there starts battling right it's not really doing much but the question is is it something we really want to promote a bunch more? And here's the real question, chat. This is what I want you all to think about. Close your eyes with me. What is a better way to make Dredge more fun? Or to make Dredge a part of the metagame, sorry. Is it to make a new fun card that could go into Dredge and change what the deck does, right? And have a new payoff. For example, Ox of Agonis is a good example of something along that lines. Or do you want Golgari Grave Troll? Right? Gregory Grave Troll might not even be enough. Right? It's not even clear to me that, you know, <laughs> that uh, Gregory Grave Troll is like going to solve that problem in a real way. Right? I think it would, but it isn't like, it isn't like Oko. It isn't like Birthing Pod. I'm not just like, fuck that shit. Ain't happening. So, right? Regard Grave Troll 
I believe is not where I would put my points in trying to fix stretch. If I was at Wizards of the Coast or I worked in card design and maybe I was given the task of like make dredge good, right? Or make specifically good, not great, right? Like make it a playable deck again, a big part of the format. Dragari Grave Troll wouldn't be my solution, right? I wouldn't go in that direction. I would go in a direction of creating fun, cool, exciting cards. So, that is sort of that on that. Mm hmm It is. Dragari Grave Troll sees play. Although they have... Um, we can. Yeah, we totally can, dummy. Um, if listen, if y'all want me to talk about design and that sort of stuff, that is sort of what I want. I, that's like the job I want, right? I want to work in game design, um, and I want to do that sort of stuff. So I kind of want to do that work commentary. Those are kind of my two dream jobs. Um, so I'm I'm happy to do that stuff, and maybe that's just what my stream turns into because I just don't love playing Magic uh, on stream, but I love talking about Magic. I could do this for another two hours. My voice you know allowed me to um also i have work stuff i do need to do but it's four o'clock we're good now i got a lot of my article done earlier today um so i guess that's a good way to say lord thank you for the follow uh if you think you like this sort of stuff follow maybe i'm going to try and do some more things like this obviously doing something like this is really hard to do consistently but we can maybe have stuff like that and i really like talking about magic and thinking about it in this sort of way and these sort of discussions and that's sort of you know what i'm about so you know maybe that's just my niche or whatever um but green sun zenith time hmm where does green sun zenith fall where on the list is green sun zenith is it too good you get access to all the creatures in your deck at all time is it just a little scary is it gonna make a deck like elves just a little too much or maybe a naya zoo deck just a little strong is it risky to unban? You maybe could do it, but it's not really worth it. Where is Green Sun Zenith? It'd be really strong in Amulet Titan. Yeah, that's a good point. Where do I put Green Sun Zenith? Well, here's where it is. And I lied about this category. Uh, let's just say a few worries. All right. I always knew Green Sun Zenith was going to be here, and I always knew that category was going to change. I just had to debate y'all because I knew that you wouldn't. St I I knew that you wouldn't stay around if there was a you know a not just safe to unban category. So here we are. This is where I'm at. Yeah. So this is the the one card uh, that gunned to my head. If I had to unban one card, and there might be other cards, I will say that. This is not the last time we're going to visit this category today. Um, but this is the one card, if I had to unban something where you're going to pull the trigger, I, I'm going to unban this, right? So, just not true, Sweeney. Uh, at least personally, we can disagree. We can have a conversation to that. So, Let's very quickly go over some of the things that Green Sun Zenith does that are unfun and I think are bad. I want to quickly talk about those. I hate that Dryad Arbor and Green Sun Zenith becomes a big part of green decks, right? I fucking hate that. I hate that Yog Moth and Amulet Titan and all of those sort of things are going to get that. And I don't believe that Bowmaster and Renin Six and Unholy Heat and Fury and Solitude are good reasons to, you know, not allow this card, right? And sort of make it so... <laughs> uh, sorry, my, my brain broke for a second. I was reading some of your messages. Um, I, I don't believe that is reason that it's safe. I will say those cards are punishing to the play pattern we were talking about. And that is, you know, not great. I will say that I don't love how samey Green Sun Zenith can make games, right? By having um, <coughs> a, a tutor and a card like this all the time, you sort of uh, are going to have the same games happen a lot, right? 
I don't really love Ella Domri's call. I don't really like Demonic Tutor. I don't like those as designs because they create samey games. And yes, there are going to be bullets, which are cool, right? But I believe that, you know, Green Sun Zenith sort of going back in your deck and being a thing you can redraw and being at really low cost to just throw a Dryad Arbor in your deck uh, and then, like, have access to these things all the time is not super great. I agree. It would be, I think, pretty good in Amulet. I think you would play this card. Um, I'm not sure... I think you probably just end up playing four. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how the deck would look because I haven't thought about it too, too much in that department. But that's simply because I thought about the other stuff. I do think it'd be good in Amulet. You know, it'd be another Titan and it would be access to Dryad Arbor, get to Azusa, Dryad of the Elysian Grove mana, be access to more Dryad of the Elysian Groves. It's a very strong card. No one's no one's arguing this card is weak. I'm not saying Green Sun's Anth is weak. I, the sort of last big point... Uh, is it is a lot of downward pressure on green creatures, right? Green creatures now all have to be designed with this in mind, right? So, um, sorry, I was just reading what someone said in chat. Um, just because green sun Zen, I, I, I gotta stop reading chat because I'm starting to get a little tired and like I'm trying to read and think about what y'all are saying, but you know, whatever. Green sun Zenith sort of does create a lot of design uh, restraints, right? Like, okay, all of our green creatures for all time um, are sort of under the guise of like, well, Green Sun Zenith sort of gets them. Is that, are we okay with that, right? Grist is a great example. This tutors Grist, right? Um, and, you know, like, that's not really the intent. Grist wasn't really, you know, Grist was designed where like that's gonna happen in Legacy, but not Modern. Um, and like Grist is a really cool card. I think Grist is a card we should be protecting. Grist is the good guy or she's the good girl, good girl, Grist. And then you pat her on the head. Um, but Green Sun Zenith, I think does have some benefits and is safer than Splinter Twin. So Splinter Twin, for example, is an immediately in the game card, right? When you play Splinter Twin, the game is over. Green Sun Zenith just makes your deck more redundant and it makes it so that you don't need to, like, that like you just have access to your things more, which I don't like, but it isn't game-ending, right? In a very similar way, we talked about how Birthing Power is a fuck-you-and-die card, but Death Right Shaman is, like, we keep playing, I have a huge advantage. Green Sun Zenith versus Splinter Twin is a fuck-you-and-die card, and this is, like, a, uh, oh, we keep playing to, like, a lesser degree on both, right? So, um... <laughs> I'm content farming chat. Um, but yeah, like Green Sun Zenith, uh, I think just does open the door to some new interesting stuff. Yes, I think there are downsides of Green Sun Zenith. Yes, I do think Green Sun Zenith would have some problems. And I don't love that Dryad Arbor would become a big part of it. But I think having this card would create some more creature combo decks that are notably really oppressed right now and i don't think we're gonna get fury and solitude banned i don't think that's gonna happen right i would love if those cards are banned but i sort of th well i should say this i love it enough you know that i'm like down but anyways um grins and zenith pushes some power in that direction and i think having cards or having decks like sam wise and yog moth and those sort of things be some of the better decks in modern is a plus this card's also very good in yog moth we haven't talked about that yet right dried arbor is already a card they play young wolf is the thing they play grist uh grist is a card they play they'd be very happy to have this cards like quarter calling are you know arguably stronger in that type of strategy and maybe green sun zenith changes the strategy in the deck so it isn't the case anymore but Green Sun sort of adds a new thing to those decks, right? So Green Sun Zenith, I think, adds enough to the decks, changes stuff up, and, you know, I just think that it is the safest card to unban where things go the least wrong. Um, and in part, that's because Bowmaster, Ren6, Fury, Leyline Binding, Solitude, you know, the cards I've said a million times.
Right, but Plague Engineer wasn't doing shit like Fury does. And I would argue that Green Sun Zenith is my peace offering to the Birthing Pod players. Birthing Pod players all tell me the same thing. They go, Mason, I just really like creature toolboxy decks, and it would be really fun if I could play with them. And Green Sun Zenith is my way of saying, hey, you don't win the game, you get a huge advantage. And I think that's a big difference. And that is something that we just have to sort of cover, right? And yeah, Yogg is a creature toolbox deck and is one of the most beloved decks in modern. A lot of people like Yogg, right? Also, a lot of people don't get mad at Yogg, right? And like, it's like, there are obviously everyone hates something, right? And there are people who are very mad at Yogg, but very rarely does someone go, F fucking Yogg, fucking stupid bullshit deck. I wish fucking Watsu would fucking ban Yogg moth. God damn, I fucking hate that deck. Just fucking, I can't ever play. Just fucking kills me. All my little creatures, blah, blah, blah. That's shit that people say about, like, Fury and Solitude. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Yogg makes some people angry. All cards are going to be divisive. Um, but, that's okay. It's more just, I think Yogg is the good guy, not the bad guy. And maybe if Yogg was better, it would turn into the bad guy. But it's not for right now, so it's not. <sighs> okay. It's too good. Let's just not even, let's not even fucking tantalize y'all with where's your Hogak. Hogak is too good. Hogak didn't have trample. Maybe we could have a conversation, but Hogak's too good. Doesn't really take much thinking about it. I think it's sad. I know a lot of you like Hogak. Hogak sometimes is the best deck in Legacy for a little bit, but. But Mason, uh, Solitude and Leyline Binding, they just solve all my problems. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> oh, Solitude. You, with Solitude in the format, I can have my beloved Hogak back. No, it's just not how it works. You don't get to have Hogak. Because Leyline Binding and Solitude are around. You don't get to have Hogak because Endurance is around. That's not... How is Endurance what breaks Green Sun Zenith? I gotta figure this out. How is Endurance what breaks... These are two different questions. How is Endurance? Or is it the same? Okay, gotcha, gotcha, my bad. I was trying to figure it out. Is it a sorcery? Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. I'm having someone make a fucking... You know the, the Squidward meme where it's like the war flashbacks? That's me with Solitude Leyline Binding. Fucking one more goddamn person tells me about motherfucking Solitude Leyline Binding. We can have strong creatures. Um, one second. All right. Give me one second. I need to message somebody for a work thing. Oh, my God. There are so many messages. Oh, my God. What's happening? Oh, no. Okay. Yeah, Mill's the best deck in Pioneer. Have y'all ever played against Modern Green Tron? This mills you out. I uh, I played Modern Green Devotion at uh, my LGS. It left my Stone Brain, and 
as soon as I started making mana, people would just concede, and I was like, whew, I've got a 14-card sideboard. So I don't got Stonebrain with me, it's in one of my other decks. Anyways, Hypergenesis, too good. I think it's technically in this category, but it's just too good. It doesn't really add a lot of fun. I think it just sort of leads so much of kills. We already have Cascade decks. We have the Warp World deck, which I think already sort of goes over a lot of this, and kind of covers that. So I don't really think we need Umazawa's Jite. Where does it go? There's a lot of places you could put Jit, right? There's a few worries. Like, maybe it could be a little too good in Hammer, but it's like oppressing creatures, and it involves creature combat, and creature combat is actually something we kind of want to encourage, right? Like, getting creatures in combat is what a lot of fun magic is made, right? Like, attacking is good. Inversely, you could argue... Once you get your jit going, you sort of always win creature combat, right? So while the idea and the goals are aspirational, the reality is not, right? And in reality, we are sitting here and we're playing these sort of jit mirrors and they're not very fun. And one person gets ahead and they stay ahead. And that sort of thing happens. Now you could argue it makes the deck like Hammer too good, right? Or maybe some Stoneforge Mystic control deck. Um... And that's sort of why it's there, you know. It's just too much going on there. I would argue it's in the the, the highest category, which is just too good. I think JIT just dominates creature combat a little bit too much. And yes, the idea of Umazawa's JITE, I think is... I, I, I should say this. I can see a lot of strong arguments to put this card in one of these two camps instead, right? I can see a lot of strong arguments. In ways that I can't really imagine for Birthing Pod, for example. Um, so, JIT, in my opinion, and sort of where I'm at at this moment in time, is that once it hits the battlefield, it starts dominating creature combat in a way that is really hard to catch back up from, right? Uh, Umazawa's was JITE sort of just demands a lot of you, and, <laughs> and, and just sort of, I just think Pod is a good example, that's all. Um, I've been saying it the whole stream for a reason. Um, so this is interesting. Uh, I, I want to bring this point up in chat really quick. What I like about JIT, once it hits, it makes Bowmasters irrelevant. Something I think we should encourage. That's an interesting point, right? Is making a card like Bowmaster or Ren 6 irrelevant uh, worth a card like Umazawa's JITTE entering the format, right? Um... I wouldn't say you're necessarily wrong. I would just argue that Uma's out, like, Jitte works really well with Bowmaster. And probably what ends up happening is Bowmaster and Umazawa's Jitte are really strong together. And those cards probably see a lot of play together. And having something like the army token that you can throw away to get Jit counters is pretty appealing. So uh, while Jit would kill opposing. Uh, Orcish Bowmasters, I think that there's a strong chance Jit might actually just be good with Orcish Bowmasters. Um, I personally will talk more about Orcish Bowmaster in a little bit. Um, I think it sort of falls under my five opinion cards that y'all are going to be mad about, but we'll sort of see. Jit sort of was a soft opinion card. Um, once again, I think you can make really strong arguments that it's risky to unban. Uh, you maybe could, but not really worth it. I think that's, like, maybe the best place for JIT, um, where that's sort of what I said, right? Like, you, you could do these things. I personally think it's a little too strong, but, right, uh, oh, that Spaz, that has been this list in a lot of ways. Um, but maybe that maybe that's the, the next talking stream, is my opinions about Magic. I did do a, a Twitter thread that did really well once, which was, for every like, I'll make a hot take. Um, and I thought I was going to get cancelled for some of them and people just loved it instead it was crazy okay oh, I, I love the prediction stuff that's interesting I'm curious to see where, where y'all think it actually gets uh, where they end up because we only have three, six, seven cards left so you know we're, we're closing in um, well Freddy you might think it's kind of obvious but for some people it might not be they don't play with those cards and that's kind of the whole point of the stream sorry uh, so Jit it's a little risky. I personally think 
that it is too strong, but you could easily sell me on risky to unban. You maybe could, but not really worth it. I'll leave it here for now just to appease people. Um, maybe I'll move it, but this is not really worth it, I think. You know, just not really going to be a fun time. Uh, I guess you could also argue that Skull Clamp kind of falls in that tier. Right, but it's not really worth it. Okay. I don't know where that is, Samantha, so we'll just leave it here. All right, so. Anyways. Um, there are clear cards you can go to fight uh, Amulet, so. I know. Once Upon a Time. Where is Once Upon a Time? I had Green Sun Zenith as safe to unban. Do I have Once Upon a Time there? Is it risky but not really worth it? Where does Green Sun Zenith go? Because you could argue Green Sun Zenith, I'm sorry, not Green Sun, uh, Once Upon a Time does a lot of good things, right? It creates less non-games. It adds consistency. A lot of its powers in smoothing, right? It's two mana to cast normally, right? What is sort of going on with Once Upon a Time? Where is it in sort of the zeitgeist or whatever? And I believe Once Upon a Time is too good. It's banned. It's too good. I think this is obvious to a lot of people that have played with this card. But if you haven't, it might feel like a card that uh, should be unbanned or could be unbanned. I personally believe that if Once Upon a Time just cost green as the first spell and cost, you know, 2G or 3G, uh, it would be a totally fine card. Uh, it would still see play. It would be strong. We would have conversations about it. But I think putting it where it's tied to G and actually making it have to be your first play um, instead of a free play is where I'd want the card. And I understand the idea of you're on Eldraine and you want games to start with Once Upon a Time. That is so cute. That is so kawaii. And I can just imagine game designers having that conversation. I think they just shot a little too high on that. And they did that a lot with Eldraine. And that's okay. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody has those days. Personally, just think the card should be more expensive and it would be good. Um, for example, if you told me uh, there was a card like Ever After or whatever, or some fairy tale name, right? And the fairy tale card was this, this card. But maybe it's all four cards. It costs G and then... It was like a sorcery for three and a G, right? I would be okay with that. I think that would be fine. The free version of it, where it's also so easy to weave into your turns because it already weaves itself into mana efficient decks or decks that want, like, have high impact creatures and lands, like Infect or whatever, as an instant as well, is just too much. It's just too much. So, um, I would like a fixed Once Upon a Time. I think that would be... That's how you make a strong one, in my opinion. Um, regardless. Ponder. Oh, Ponder. Where does Ponder lie? Because it's an interesting card. People really like cantrips. There aren't a lot of cantripping blue decks in modern. Would it even be that good? You know? How does it work? Well, I think Ponder probably goes into the doesn't really work in tournament magic slash it should be like slash annoying cards. Um, Ponder, I think you can make a strong argument that could go in any of these categories, right? It's probably safe to unbound a few worries, right? Adding a lot of consistency to decks is maybe not what you want to do, but currently decks already have a lot of things that provides some consistency slash cards are worth more than they were before. You could have it there. You could also make it a pretty strong argument that it's risky to unban. You maybe uh, could, but it's not really worth it, right? Ponder is sort of a card that makes games more redundant, makes less of the game about interacting with your opponent slash your opponent being engaged in some way, right? Like when I cast Ponder, you never really interact with it. Sometimes you do. And I sit there with these three cards and play with some hidden information to figure stuff out. Whereas if you're comboing, right, if I'm playing Seething Song, there's a lot of back and forth, right? I Seething Song, maybe you want to counter that. Maybe you don't, right? 
there's there is some other good stuff going on with combo decks. Um, I think adding the redundancy and the res, the the sameness is a, a strike against ponder in the same way. Notably, it's a strike against green sunsiness, right? I know I said safe to unban with a few worries um, when it comes to green sunsiness, but ponder I think sort of you know has some of the same things, but that's all it has going for it is making games samier and having access to a lot of cards. And I think a lot of Spiker Paths love this card, and it's a card that rewards skill, right? Um, also, fuck this artist. I just remembered the artist story. I don't have a different ponder. Pretend we have a different ponder art on screen. Um, regardless, um, ponder is, I think, just a little too good. Um, and I don't think it's really in the band makes one deck too OP or whatever. And I don't think it's really too good to be put in the ban too good category so i think it's risky to unban you maybe could but it's not really worth it you're not really getting a lot out of it so be it where does preordain revolve right preordain sort of uh yeah this author is some pretty problematic takes um so, Preordain has a lot of the same stuff that Ponder has going on. There are a few bonuses. First, there's no shuffling. The shuffling on Ponder, unironically, adds a lot of time to a game, right? Over the course of three games, even if you just cast Ponder in two of those, probably takes 30 to 40 seconds off the clock if one player does it, right? So, like, and if you're shuffling correctly... Um, so, like, that is a, a big part of it. Preordain has a couple advantages. For starters, you, you don't shuffle, and you just get the two cards in front of you, and that's less choices than three. Two is less than three, more news at 11. Thanks for the subscription. Um, but, like, unironically, that, that does change things, right? Um, I think that Preordain is quicker, resolves quicker, you see some less cards, um, and is l less powerful than ponder right like ponder is stronger than preordain this is why you often see ponder in all the legacy decks and not preordain right preordain is sort of better at uh finding something right away for this turn while ponder is about sort of getting more selection um so i think preordain this isn't the same category i think you could make an argument that it's safe to unban with a few worries but I don't think adding more cantrips is really going to create a lot more fun. And I'd much rather create new cantrips that we know are not as... Like, for example, Consider is a perfect, like, card for what I'm talking about. Consider, in a lot of ways, was like, oh, it's not quite Thought Scour, and it's different, and it creates this new, unique, ooh, what do we do here going on? That is really cool. And I'd rather have more cards like that um, going on. Great. The Taxi and Probe is basically... So there's a lot of problems with the Taxi and Probe. Let's just... There's a lot going on with Probe. First, it is... Like, Mason loves spell-based combo. You don't even know how much Mason loves spell-based combo. Oh, really quick, let me check something before I talk about the approach. Let me double check something. Okay, yeah, sorry. Just talking to my girlfriend and trying to make some stuff work with uh, coaching. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, Serum Vision is just like a weaker preordain. Like, people don't like playing with weak cards. Um, they think they do, but they, they don't. Is Dan Scott... Yeah, yeah, Death of the Authors, yes. We agree, uh, Twitch Shark Dummy. Um, so, why is uh, Gitaxian Probe too good, right? Lots going on here. First, um, it's essentially Street Wraith in a lot of ways, right? 
Uh, notably different than Street Wraith in a few. One, it's a blue card instead of a black card, right? That makes it stronger with cards like Force Negation and Subtlety. Uh, obviously, the other one's better with Grief and uh, the Force of Despair, which doesn't really see play. Small, but worth noting. Another notable thing is that the Taxian Probe is a sorcery, where uh, Street Wraith is a creature, and sorcery is a harder type to get into your graveyard nowadays. Those are both small, small, small factors, right? They don't really matter to me. But th they are notably little things in favor of Gitaxian Probe not coming back where Street Wraith sort of exists. The biggest thing to me about Gitaxian Probe is it actually removes the fun part of magic, which is the guessing and the figuring out, right? Um, just getting to know your opponent's hand for free and know you can go for it is so so powerful wow this song is really loud on the i'm gonna turn it down a little bit um oh wow Ooh. there we go okay um but like the the like the looking at each other's hand element that is actually a huge part of this um where just knowing what's going on i think makes the game net more unfun right the hidden information part of magic is where a lot of the fun comes from is where a lot of the excitement comes from it's a lot of where these cool moments come from so getaxian probe in my opinion is sort of a thing where it's like okay like how do i say this you maybe could unban it on power level right but it doesn't really make the game any more fun I think you could argue that I could have a, like, you could maybe unban, but doesn't make the game more fun. Could, like, maybe be, like, one of the tiers, right? Um, and I think a tax and probe sort of falls in that game. I do think there's also something to be said about having probe and shadow, uh, probe, shadow, street, wraith all in the same deck might be too much. So, who is the person... <laughs> uh, <laughs> I understand that there is some amount of I guess here's my real question uh, Chrome Sphere is are you saying that like facetiously, facetiously or are you saying that for real because the difference between one and zero mana is more than one <laughs> that is like it, it is hard for me to explain to you if you don't understand that, and I can, I, I will if you give me a second, but one mana is a lot more than zero mana, and two mana is a lot more than one. And so peak being one mana is way different than a taxi and probe. Okay, cool. Great. Just some people might be serious, whatever. If you're on YouTube or whatever, and you're like, yeah, peak is legal or whatever. Peak is like so much worse than a taxi and probe. Even if it was colorless. Even if Peak was a colorless spell. Right? And this is a color spell. Worth noting, too, you do get to sometimes just be taxi and probe for a blue. Right? Alright. Yeah, ban Peak. Oh, Treasure Cruise. It's just stronger than Dig Through Time. I think. Um... I would say that Dig Through Time in its deck is typically when decks play Dig Through Time, Dig Through Time is a more pivotal part of those decks because Treasure Cruise decks often play cards that can trip. Um, hi, Lobster. Uh, they can trip and have a lot of card selection already. So, Dig Through, so Treasure Cruise is more of a raw card thing, and Dig Through Time is often finding key cards. So it might seem like Dig Through Time is stronger because when you resolve it, your brain correlates with winning more. Despite Treasure Cruise actually being a little bit stronger. Um, yeah, I think that's awesome, Lord. Like, the peak thing you just said is great. Um, yeah. And we have not talked about the Land Cycler cards, but they matter for all these discussions too when it comes, right? Like, they are sort of janky fetch lands um and they're kind of like Lorraine's reveal especially is like 
hey, this is sort of like another fetch land. Uh, really, Little Ranger Reveal is a tap land, right? But it kind of like fetches because it fills the graveyard. And it also gets to be a spell, which is medium, but like, as we've seen, it's worth it to have like one tap land in your deck, because that tap land is also Jace's Ingenuity. Um, two you versus one you, yeah. But I need treasure, yeah. Treasure Cruise, I, you know, Treasure Cruise would be great for the prowess decks, right? Um, which is a deck I do think is a, a good part of modern and something I personally would really like um, to be a bigger part of modern. And if I had the keys to the castle where could give design directives, I would try to figure out a way to help make that deck better or make decisions to help that deck. Um, I don't even need to talk about Treasure Cruise. I think we all get it. We see it in Pioneer uh, with the Birds deck, right? It really subsidizes that deck. Like, a lot of the reason cards like Go Blank are strong against Phoenix is because they make cards like Treasure Cruise not work. Not because they get the Phoenixes. That's like an added bonus. Does that make sense, chat? Awesome. Tybalt's Trickery. Just doesn't really... It's like... It's just not... Like... I, I am shocked this card is... It's just not like a real magic card. This card's like Bridge from Below. It's like not a real magic card. You know what I mean? Um, it's really cool. It's just way too cheap. If you want to have something like that, I think magic should. But Tybalt's Trickery, unfun, blah, 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 blah. Right? It just, it, it, it just shouldn't be a thing. Um, I just don't think it's like worth it. Um... Uro. Where does Uro belong? Well, I think we all kind of know the answer to that if we played ever with Uro against Uro. And that's that Uro is too good. Uro is too good. That card, um, I'm going to set this up so we can start getting ready for the, the Twitter screenshot. Uh, white. Hang on one second. White, blue, black, red, green. There you go. We 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 board ordered these for the the people at home. Anyways, um, Uro is just like one of the ultimate card advantage cards and one of the ultimate fair game cards. You can have a deck that is just interaction and Uro, and like one other small little element, and that is like just a deck, and it's like a good deck. And Uro is just incredibly strong and works incredibly well with fetch lands and you know it's good because it also like it, it just says you should know it's you know it's stronger even without being tied to fetch lands because of how it played in standard and in uh pioneer where it's it got banned in both of those formats as well for just being too much uro fun fact this is a, a cool thing about uro um this list isn't really fun there should be at least three cards in the bottom bare minimum including punishing fire well, I don't know. I think people had fun. They, they hung out for three hours or whatever. Uh, so, I don't know. I'm sorry you didn't enjoy it, but I did. Uh, Uro, is, what I was going to say, is actually the card that got me to the Pro Tour the first time. I won my first PTQ playing Uro. Um, and it was fun because I actually, like, I had the Bant Uro deck uh, a week before kind of anyone else did. I sort of found it on uh, Twitter via someone in, I believe, China. No, it was Japan. Uh, it's their F and M, and um, I like changed the deck a little bit, and then I walked in, and I was the only person in the room playing Uro Nissa that weekend. That shit was dope. And I got into the Pro Tour. Sure, that's fair. Is the ban list? It doesn't make sense based on what the ban list is supposed to accomplish. I don't know how to, intrinsically, thank you. I was like, I know what that word is, but I don't know how to say it out loud. Uh, dyslexic. I'm severely dyslexic. Don't judge me, chat. Ah, sorry. Uh, I'm glad a lot of you enjoyed it, and I'm sorry if I came off a little defensive there, Voodoo. Um, the dregs. If band equaled broken, then we would still... Yeah, but I don't think... 
Nicodle is broken. I don't think Jace is banned. Or it is uh, broken, right? I think things have changed. Um, I just believe, I think there's just a fundamental difference between you and I and our beliefs here, where I believe a lot of, for example, every card north of this line, I believe to be like too good. And Splinter Twin sort of as well. Um, and I just sort of think a lot of the ban lists actually can't be unbanned. You and I just disagree on that, slash me and some of chat, right? It's not, I understand that you don't like where this is landed up, where it's come from, uh, but this is just honestly what I believe. And I believe these cards are just too good to be unbanned. And I've seen a lot of people on Twitter today talk about a lot of these cards and say they're banned, uh, unbanned worthy, right? I personally don't agree. I just spent three and a half hours, we'll say three hours and 20 minutes between my little breaks and talking to chat, talking about why I believe that to be the case. If you don't agree with me, I think that's totally reasonable. I do not think I am God's gift to magic. I do not think I have all the answers. Um, I do not think that I am 100% right with this. And I would be very interested to know sort of what, uh, you know, people who are the ones allowed to make the decision would think of this list, but I can't really talk to them about that. It's not really something I get to do. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe someday I will get to, but for now, really, this is sort of one of those situations where, um, 